And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Geek Watch, a subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have one and two good brothers, one of them being a, one of them being a newcomer. Ha 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 ha. We have the man who is taking over all of all of your anime, um, all, of, all of your anime, stealing all your waifus, and and and, ta and guiding you through all of your VTubers under under a pair of star-shaped sunglasses. Good brother shades. And we have a and we have a newcomer, the man who the man who probably headbangs harder than ch than child Midoriya. Good bro good brother Crow. <laughs> uh yeah. I said a whole thing that I tried to put silly crow, but no, I though my metal days are gone now. I'm now into the smooth, smooth music of vaporwave, the future. Uh -huh. <laughs> the, the, fu the future, the future according to drugs. Hey, 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 hey! <laughs> Those drugs were legal when I bought them. When I use them, that's a different problem, right? Don't, don't stop. <laughs> well, that's a, that is a case of what that is a case of what I like to call nomfop. Yeah. NMFP, not my fucking problem. You people these days. Back in my day, we had laws. We arrested. Right now, we're just ruining the drug experience for everybody. This is what happens, man. <laughs> Look, I don't, I don't need, I don't need to because if I if I need to get that experience, I can just I can just load up cat soup. <laughs> or you could just watch some horrible horrible television. That's the same thing too. <laughs> or either, oh, that or I can, either that or I can subject some of my students to mind game again. <laughs> Mind game. The, wait, there's actually no, actually randomly there's on ironically I think there's an RPG called Mind Game, but I'll get in that later. Oh lord! I'm not talking about the RPG. I'm talking about the anime movie. I don't think I've seen. I don't. I haven't seen such horror. But if it's really bad, I hope. I hope it's. It's uh, not as much horror. horror. Yeah, yeah. It's not horror <laughs> as much as it is drug trip. Awesome. All right, it's one of those like serial. All right, I got you. I got you. Okay. It's an Uwasa film. Fair. <laughs> he, um, that's all, that's all I had to he say. can he can di he can dial it back, but the only way to have him dial it back is to not have him write. <laughs> but take away. Eh, but anyway. as as you as you can clearly see on the screen, um, this week is the is what is the second episode in what in what I'm calling the Exodus trilogy. There will be a, there will be a third part of this um, sometime next month. Because there has been there has been a as I mentioned in the as I mentioned when when I did the um bat forty k to BattleTech thing, there has been an interesting series of exoduses from from one fan base to another, largely because one of them started to get fed up and and um jump and jumped on and jumped on viable alternatives, which is something that I always warn. There. Sometimes I have to warn them by referencing the sword of Damocles, but that might be a little bit too high art for some. <laughs> so the first episode, as as I mentioned, was um was from Space Marines to Mech Warriors, talking about how Games Workshop's recent bit of bullshit, high grade bullshit, especially since now that NDA that I found has gotten confirmed twice to be real. It's the same NDA that I sent you a while back, Shades. I'm not sure if you read yeah. I'm not sure if you read through it and I'm not reading the whole thing, but I got the gist of it. Yeah, a rolling, a rolling three-year non-compete. Who, who the fuck puts that on a non-disclosure agreement? You'd be surprised how people sink their things in there these days. Oh, you'd be surprised. Yeah, yeah. No, you'd be surprised no. at how people sink in there these days, man. Um, but, but the second one that I knew, and I knew I wanted to do this. When all, when all out came and went, and especially what, especially when this gla this sunglasses wearing motherfucker actually actually got actually got worn down to jo to joining the side to joining the side of the angels on this. Even though I was even though I wasn't able to be there for the um for for the first part of that particular adventure because I had um monastery duties, but. This, but this second episode of this trilogy is all about the is all about the graps, because it is as you can as you can see on the screen from lapsed entertainment to all elite, and I think I think I think early I think to kind of set the stage 
I think it would be. I think. I think a good opening act would be to de would be to delve into something that I often bring up in my own um in, in my own interviews here on the show, and that is our first our first exposure to wrestling and what and what made it stick. Now, for me, it's a. I'll go. I'll go first to kind of set the stage. Um. I've a friend of a friend in the neighborhood was a tape trader. An er an early tape trader in the 90s. And my first exposure was old AWA tapes that I had that I had seen because, you know, Minnesota. And so and some some tape some tapes from from ECW and then later on um FMW, which is how I fell in love with Hayabusa. God rest his soul. And I had a, I was a, I um it wasn't until it wasn't until a bit later that I started to see parallels because one particular game that I that I enjoyed way back in the day that's now a scavenger hunt is Saturday Night Slam Masters. I say it's a scavenger hunt because you because it's a case of it's a case of spot the reference when you look at every character in that old game and how <laughs> how many of them. How many of them have at least have at least one parallel to a, to a wrestler from WCW in the nineties? Doesn't exactly hurt, doesn't exactly hurt that the guy who did the character art is the same guy behind Hokuto no Ken. But af but after but just that just that sort of that sort of comp that sort of action and and seeing. Seeing, seeing, seeing some of those, seeing some of those characters ended up, um, ended up appealing to a young, to a young me, which I ended up going in and out, in and out of because, um, because of, uh, because of other obligations. Then, re then other, then other events happened, and I, and I rediscovered the indies, especially, um, first wrestling, which, again, not to sound too Minnesotan, is called that because it's held at Prince's nightclub, First Avenue. Uh, Monk, don't mean to interrupt you, but we might have one more joining us. Oh, hang check on. the gates. <laughs> hang up. Hang on a minute. I think we need to add a little international flair to this uh, to this whole thing. I am I am working uh, I am working on that now. So let me. Okay. All right. See you back at the raw. Let him know. All right. I think I, I think I've given them the ro the roll. Yeah, I saw it. I oh. let him know to check the chat at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. I think I know who it is, but you know, no spoilers. <laughs> But I'm I'm just, I'm fairly cer I'm fairly certain that he'll he will ma he will make his appearance shortly. Yeah, he says he'll be he'll be there he'll be here in a moment. All right. All right. All right. He should be a smartass and say, is that a moment in actual time or restaurant time? <laughs> Let me be specific. It's a mo it's it's a moment of a moment. So within a moment, you know. <laughs> oh, there it is. Ah, uh, there. Our. Our fourth, our fourth surprise get, our fourth surprise guest making a making a <sighs> making a late run making a late run in, is good, um, good brother Mace. Good evening, gentlemen. How are we? How are we? How uh, are you, my Australian brother? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. It's the sun is up while yours is down. Left is right and upside down seems to be the normal. And we do not ride kangaroos. <laughs> yeah. No, you just run from emus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't that, that that's our greatest shame, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but then again, if you've ever come across an emu, you, you you will know that they are worth running from, okay? <laughs> I've had to, I have not had to come across an emu, but I've had to I've had my fair share encounters with a moose. And bears. <laughs> oh. Wait, wait, moose? You mean you ran away from a six foot black man impact wrestling champion? Really? Fuck off! <laughs> Damn, 
I mean, he's a nice guy, but you have to run away from the poor chap. Jeez. <laughs> like, he does one power slam, one loses their shit. God. It was a power <laughs> slam, guys. Just a power slam. Up and over, you know? Shades. I feel like I'm being haunted by Zan. <laughs> I was just thinking that! That's what I need. Another bane of my fucking existence. <laughs> I, did not get this. Gonna be, I, sh I should have known this was going to happen, but man. <laughs> so, to, get, to catch you up, um, to catch you up, oh, Mace, I had just finished, um, since the t since the theme of the night is from Laps Entertainment to All Elite, um, I had, I was going over, I was going over my experience, my first introduction to wrestling and what, and what made it stick, and I'm, I'm using that as the opening act, so, since I want to go with seniority rules on this, Shades, you're up next. All right, all right. So, I, I was, uh, it was around '98 when I first had my first view. Like, I, I, or actually, I had a taste of it very early on in '19, uh, very late '98. I remember my brother was watching wrestling at the time, and it was the build up to Austin versus Kane, First Blood, where Kane said he would set himself on fire if he lost. But my first full exposure to wrestling in general started in WWE. It was shortly after St. Valentine's Day Massacre 1999. Because mm -hmm. it was just after that pay-per-view where Austin pulled out the, the win after, after Paul White intervened. And the best setup for WrestleMania 15. And I remember just, I decided I was bored. I was slipping through channels. I was like, oh, hey, that, that, that WWF thing was on. Okay, let's just see what this is all about. And I immediately got hooked. Just seeing the build up and watching it, I was recording every week, and then, and of course, this was right in the tail end of the Monday Night War. So every once in a while, I tune into WCW, but I missed the good years. I came in during during the tailspin, the the tailspin spiral, that was the Vince Russo era. Well, the the upcoming Vince Russo era. So I didn't get to see the good shit, <laughs> mm -hmm. but. I remember just absolutely enjoying every single week. I was literally recording Raw and rewatching it mm -hmm. because I just loved it so much. Uh, and that's what makes today's topic so infuriating to talk about because of how much like I remember those days and how those days are long gone. Mm -hmm. And that is it's it's for that re it's as some of as some of you know I've had a. As you know, Shades, I've had a um, very adversarial attitude with nostalgia, which is something we'll be getting into later. But um, since I want to go, I want to go from the top, from the top down. Sorry, sorry, but I had to go. I had to go seniority first, and technically, Shades has seniority over you two here. <laughs> uh, Mace, I'd like you to, I'd like you to go to go next when it comes to your introduction and how it's stuck. Oh, is this like gonna be a story? Uh, I've had wrestling in my in my life, God, going back as far back as I can remember, and I'm talking like a child of six in 1989, mm -hmm. watching things like Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling cartoon in the mornings, and then uh, every now and again, the local TV channel here in Australia would play random uh summer slams wrestlemanias and stuff from years past so we're going like probably the earliest memory i have is wrestlemania 5 hogan versus savage watching that as a kid and for for a while there there was a gap where we didn't really have much wrestling on australian television though we did actually have an australian wrestling scene that i wouldn't even learn about mm -hmm. for for many many years but i can remember Oh, God, it would have been 1995, watching WCW Nitro from the uh, the MB MGM Grand or the uh, or the or the Disney uh, lot that they had way back when, mm -hmm. and sort of getting stuck into watching wrestling at that point in time. I would go out to the local video store and get the the VHS tapes that were always three months behind the current product until we had the introduction of cable television here in Australia at about late 97, 98. 
where I would be able to watch Raw and Nitro on separate days, on separate channels, Mm -hmm. but I was able to watch it. So it was just getting into, like, the characters, the the storylines, the larger-than-life characters, seeing the icons of the business like Savage and Hogan and Piper and that on WCW, and then seeing the, the at the time new up and comers like The Rock and Stone Cold and Shawn Michaels on the WWF, and just seeing the contrast between the two, especially in the nineties because WCW was old school wrestling, mm-hmm. and the WWF or before it became WWE was the Attitude Era where it was you know crotch chops and swearing on television. I thought it was great, absolutely brilliant, and then. About 2001, I got to actually go to my first Australian wrestling event with Professional Championship Wrestling, and I actually got to meet one of the uh, legends of Australian wrestling, Mario Milano, and from there it opened up a a big gate where I, I actually found myself within a couple of years actually wrestling in uh, a few wrestling promotions here in Australia being trained by Mario Milano and a few others of his generation. Mm-hmm. So I had that experience of not only being a fan and watching these guys coming out as real-life superheroes in my eyes, but I got to stand across the ring from uh, the local guys that I trained with and guys that have gone on to very successful careers. Uh, you know, uh, to Neil of uh, Buddy Murphy or Matthew Buddy Matthews or whatever he wants to call himself now, uh, the former Bronson Reed. I, I was training with those guys. I got to see those guys when they were rookies, when they were first learning how to take their first bumps. So uh, in that respect, I got addicted to the the adrenaline rush that comes from performing in front of a live crowd. So my, my experience with wrestling is basically injected into my veins it's a part of my blood it's what it's part of my life now that i respect and love every single day Mm -hmm. and hold up i want to ask you a question uh mace Uh, this is a serious question mario mario milano same mario milano that was in all japan pro wrestling in the late 70s that same one what possible not sure if he actually uh, he possibly did work japan yeah, no. uh, I, I know he was a part of the original WCW, which was run by Jack Little here in Australia before it was bought by uh, Ted Turner. Good old Ted Turner. No, all right. Yeah, because the reason why I'm aware of Milano, because he's in all Japan, he's talked heavily by a lot of the guys who look into him, like Zeus. Uh, Baba has talked about him saying that, you know, by his ring name. I'm sorry. His, he goes. He said, uh, "Belfon Senpai was like so Belfon Kun was like was was a stiff son of a bitch. Like he loved how he punched." I'm like, "Wait, that's the same guy." The giant Baba talked about. Yeah, I'm. I'm again. Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, yeah, all old all Japan tours in 1975 and 1985. That, it was okay. Cool. Yeah, that, same that, same guy. That guy. Oof. He was a yo. He was a stiff son of a bitch there for those tours. People say he punched harder than their, their ball oh, again. He, he, he did, he did. But he he was the guy. He he took one look at me and he said, "You need to come down, train at my school." I'm like, <laughs> "Okay." <at> you. <laughs> when a legend of the business says you come wrestle, you go wrestle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh man, amen, man. That's that's can't, I can't ignore that. So. Uh, I guess I'll go into what got me into wrestling. So, what got me into wrestling is like a, I would say, more personal story. So, I, I had a family friend. His name is Mister. I call him Mister. James. His last name is Carmen. And I would stay around his house during the time after school. My parents were around because they were always working and stuff. And he was into wrestling, and he was he knew a lot of the southern stuff, and he knew about ras- wrestling. He had some old WCW tapes. He had some Mid South. And then one time go on, because I was like eight, seven years old, started watching WWE with him. He was slightly smart into the business. He knew what people faking it or not, but he got my, my love into it. And because of him, I watched my first WrestleMania ever, well, at least on tape, WrestleMania 3. And I became a huge Monster Man Randy Savage mark. I have no idea who the hell Ricky Steamboat was. But that guy looked too skinny to me. But I love Randy Savage. He was big. He talked like a comic book character. He was freaking awesome. Mm-hmm. And I grew into loving wrestling since then. But then I dipped out of wrestling in, like, the mid-2000s due to, like, not life, just the product, you know? We can go on into that later. But 
I got into wrestling through a family friend, and he's with God now, so I still watch it ever up there, and because of then, I started, like, watching other type of wrestling and get my hands on. Like, do you have any idea how hard it is to watch Japanese wrestling in, like, the 90s? I don't know if Blockbuster had it or a tape, yeah, yeah. Either a tape trader or a blockbuster, or someone else would have it. It was you have, crazy. You have no idea how um, how lucky I considered myself that I was able to get those um, get those Tokyo Pop tapes of FMW. Oh my lord! Oof. Like I like I said, one of um, one of my fa- one of my favorites one of my favorites growing up was Hayabusa, and um, it is it is a bit of fortuitous timing that I'm bringing up the those old FMW tapes when. Um, when that was the most recent episode of Dark Side of the Ring on Atsushi Onida. Mm, yeah. Ooh, um. Look, oh, look, all I'll say, all I'll say in that is the the kind of the kind of craziness that goes on in death matches. We are spoiled. <laughs> yeah. Considering what <laughs> no, goes no, on in death yeah, matches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no, it, it's facts. Even though I'm not personally a fan of deathmatching style, but just the watching, like watching that something, it's like, wow, you guys are, uh, you guys are crazy, like legitimate effing crazy. <laughs> you know, like, you've, you know you've crossed yeah. a lot. You've crossed a certain threshold, and and it's time to go back when you're bringing in piranhas. Yeah, it's like, yeah, that 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 of that. That it's like, wait, are we like, are we actually setting the ring on fire? Yes, the ring will be on fire. And you just look at them like, why? Because it's cool. <laughs> and with that, with that, in, with that in mind, um, when it comes when it comes to when it comes to the the next the next phase of this, obviously, is the laps part. And I think I think all of us will have different moments where we where we ended up lapsing. I I can't really I can't really say that I lapsed simply because. Of the fact that I did that I kind of didn't it was more it was more of a constant shift um it was a con- constant shift in constant shift in and out over the over the span of 20 plus years um but what I but what I but I do th- but I would like to see that where things kind of intersect and once again seniority rule applies applies so shades you're up first all right then. Well, I remember when my my uh, even throughout the early two thousands, even when as bad as it got during the Super Cena years, I mm-hmm. still felt there was still some enjoyment to be had. But I remember the exact moment where my downward spiral into that lapse began at WrestleMania thirty. Now, for the most part, WrestleMania thirty was good, but I never finished WrestleMania thirty. Because I, well, one partly because the pay per view actually cut off for me. Uh, the WWE network, the WWE network crashed mid, like right at the end of a certain uh, of the very match I'll be speaking of here in a moment. Mm-hmm. So I missed the end of the match, and that's when I found out the actual result. I lost my shit because it was, of course, twenty one and one. Mm-hmm. I to this day, despite every argument I've ever heard, still believe that if even if you can, even if you can convince me that the streak should have ended, it should never have been Brock Lesnar. And I will fight anyone who disagrees with me on that because I can make arguments. Well, let's, but <laughs> oh, hold hold that hold that th- hold that thought because that's something that, that's something I want to ask you about when when we get to it. So go on. All right. Now that was just a start. I still held on for a little while longer. I still held on through the rest of that year. But I remember the exact pay-per-view where I finally had had enough. Where I had finally just stopped watching. These are the three phases of this lapse. It was The start was WrestleMania 30. The end of me watching wrestling on the regular was at uh, TLC 2014. Something about that pay-per-view just broke me. And I think it had to do with the TLC match between Dean Ambrose and Bray Wyatt. That match just no. Wasn't that the wasn't that the one with the t- with the t- with the TV uh, with the um, TV exploding finish? I I think it was. Let me double check. Actually, I have the whole thing. Yes, 
Yes. Yeah, trying trying to hit someone with a con with a con with a connected TV from the announce table that blew up in his face, which I think ended up getting him Geek of the Week on the on the Observer. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. I'm not surprised. Yeah, that match was that was, was like okay, I'm fucking done. I'm just done. Now I did stick around for Royal Rumble and WrestleMania for the next few years, but. I think WrestleMania 34 was the last WrestleMania I watched. I think I was that on that Wrestle call with you. Yeah, I believe you were. Like, that WrestleMania was where I finally had enough as well. It finally just said, okay, this is clearly not going to get any better, so I'm fucking done. Right, so, so, yeah. That, that, that combination of three things is just like, okay, it is very clear to me that WWE has no intention of getting any better. They're not going to fix the problems they have. They feel they're, they're making so much money doing what they do now that they have no reason to change, so why the fuck should they? So fuck it. I'm done. I don't want to deal with this shit anymore. And All right, I, get, I got you. So next... Um, Crow, I'd like I'd like you to go into your um, your lapse story. So my lapse story began the moment um, this man came up to my house and told me, "You're gonna I wrestle God. You have to accept that, and your God is dead." And I'm like, you know what? He's right. I gotta stop watching wrestling. But <laughs> what killed, honestly, killed wrestling for me is just like post summer of punk, the lack of care for the product, the people that got buried. Like for example, I don't care what anyone says. I don't understand why Dolph Ziggler is a main event guy. He can work, he can cut promos and everything, and you treat him like garbage. And the moment I got wiser to see that, like a lot of stars that I liked or people that just got treated like trash, again, it's just like post of aggression, post number five, just like it just hurt a lot. And I just stopped watching wrestling for a long time. The only time I ever watched wrestling was when people like uh, Mace uh, occasionally would recommend me a match to watch, or another person I know uh, from the out website, iHaven.net. Uh, Josh, Josh you know, my, he would recommend like, hey, watch the uh, Okada uh, Omega matches, watch Okada versus AJ Styles in New Japan and I was just trying to watch it through that I just couldn't watch the WWE that got me lapsed I would only watch things that people told me that was good, that was vetted because I just couldn't feel investing my time into this content of pain that was just for like, for Neanderthals and it hurt so bad because the people they pushed, just people that weren't like, likable, like, I'm sorry during the era of the shield, what in God's name told you to push Roman Reigns? Just because he just, you know, rock the rock's cousin? That's nepotism. Jinder Mahal. I mean, I could go on and on of all the flops of people they pushed down our throat. Baron Corbin. All right, whatever. And it just it hurt because it's like I was trying to be reasonable, like maybe no no. And they just kept crapping on my face and I just couldn't. That was my lap story essentially. And uh I can't I, I think the, the straw of the camel back that broke me was like, I guess the beginning of the end for me is the same way with Shades when Undertaker, you know, when Brock lost to Undertaker. And I understand Brock was the future. No, no, no. What broke my back, Brock, the Brock Goldberg match with Stone Cold with Austin as the referee. The way they they were in my hometown, New York City, and the way they just F the fans off, even if the fans knew that you were leaving, doesn't mean you can't give them a good match. You just did lockups and pissed us off. That's why I knew. Both the boys, the boys working the ring, and the boys in the back who cut the run of the show hate us, and I can't give people my time only because they hate you. As a as a colleague of mine would say, don't give money to people who hate you. Pretty much, yeah. Um. Now, Mace, <laughs> what about what about you? Because your your perspective, I think I think would be interesting given how given how close you were from an early age. God, it's. I've I've had that many multiple lapses over the years that it's sort of hard to to pin down exactly where it started going wrong. I think for for me it was the 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 selling of WCW had a big thing to do with a, a sort of a a beginning if you want to bring a drawing point to it. When WCW folded and all you had was WWE, or WWF at the time, and you would see the arrival of WCW guys into WWF because they had them on contract. 
It wasn't because they wanted to jump ship. It was the fact that they were bought out. And you could see it on their faces. A lot of people at that time didn't want to be there. They'd rather be anywhere else working indies or whatever. And to see that on people's faces, it does make it very easy to spot when like, there's the effort's not there. And I think, like, I, I got to that point where it was just over the idea of WWF, now that they control the market, they believe that they can control what the audience wants to see. And that started very early on with the, I'd say, the 2002 Triple H push. Oh, the, the Reign of Terror. The Reign yeah, of Terror. Yeah, the, 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 the Reign of Terror. And then leading into what is more predominantly known on the internet as the class of 2002, your Brock Lesnar's, your Randy Orton's, uh, John Cena, that and them first, coming up and starting of, really... That first wave of OVW guys. Yes. Yeah. That first big wave of OD, OVW guys coming in and being pushed to the high ranks. And I don't know what it was, but it was one of the January pay-per-views it had John Cena going through the Elimination Chamber. I can't remember exactly what year it was off the top of my head. But it was like Final Re Fatal Revolution or something, one of those. New Year's Revolution. Had that New type Year's of Revolution. name to it. New Year's Revolution, that's the one. And John Cena came out for the uh, Elimination Chamber match. And I looked at his face as he came out, and he had this extremely sour puss look on his face. And I, I was doing a, a wrestling podcast at the time and we were talking during the event and I said to the, I said to the guys, okay, Cena's going to make it through this match and Edge is going to cash in and take the belt within 10 seconds. And that was the exact, like, the exact finish of the match. Mm -hmm. Cena went through, won the Elimination Chamber, out comes Edge, pinned him in 10 seconds. And I said, how did I pick that? Because I could see it on John Cena's face and I could see it in his eyes that he was not happy. And from there, it was just back and forth where we now had the John Cena era, where Cena was on top all the time. And, you know, it's not the first time that we had one of those eras. The 90s was Stone Cold. Stone Cold was going up against everybody, win winning, dropping, and regaining the belt multiple times over a decade. But it was just, I don't know, something was different during this, this class of 2002 era when they started coming up and became a main event, where you could tell this was manufactured. Nothing See, was natural anymore, and that's probably the point where I started to drop. But where I actually went and I cut things off was about five years ago. And it was no sort of reason or, or anything. like There was no particular show, no particular event or moment that made me stop. It was the fact that I had moved in with my girlfriend at the time. I didn't have access to the shows. And I quickly realized I didn't miss those shows because I was able to replace it with something else. After a bit of a hiatus away from the Australian scene, I finally started getting back into uh, just going and watching Australian shows and being uh, a bit of behind the scenes production on, on sound and videography and stuff like that, mm -hmm. that I, I regained my love of wrestling through Australian shows. And I just realized that I could do without WWE. I didn't have to watch it. I, I would much like shades after he cut, I would watch WrestleMania. I would watch the Royal rumble and that was it. But even last year I went, I didn't even need to bother to do, to do that. And then, you know, along comes AEW and it's like, hey, I'm finally a wrestling fan like I was in the nineties again. Which we'll get we'll get to that we'll get to that in a minute. Um I want to touch on something that sh that you brought up earlier, Shades. Mm -hmm. Now you had you had said that you would that you would argue until you and I'm paraphrasing of course that you would argue until you're blue in the face that um it sh that it should not have been um that it should not have been Lesnar and I I want to make clear that I don't disagree, and incidentally, um, I remember Matt Hardy also saying that that that, that streak shouldn't end, that he, he should re he should have retired undefeated. Um, and I've and I've often heard I've often heard that that it had to end eventually, so why not Lesnar? I, I think even Heyman ended up ended up saying that during one of those between the ropes 
um, shows. Yeah, I saw that one. I saw that clip. <laughs> but now I've got I've got my own take on on the on the matter. But what? But I'd like to hear your I'd, I'd like to hear yours because I don't think you've ever gone into the reason why you were against the streak at the streak ending. The thing is, is that it, this isn't like. You know, you compare this to, like, Andre the Giant's undefeated streak. His streak had to end eventually because it was every match. He didn't have... He didn't lose. So, that made sense that eventually that kind of streak... You can't have someone go that undefeated forever. But, this was only one match a year. You, you, you could have The Undertaker win every year. And he was already nearing the end of his career as it was. Or at least it should have been the air at the end of his career. He was, going, he was going through... He, was go, he seemed to be going through at least one new surgery every few months at that point. Exactly. Yeah. He, he was... He, he may have had a couple more matches, a couple of good matches afterwards. But he did not... Have, his tank was running dry at that point. Mm -hmm. And so, it, you know, he should have just retired undefeated. You know, he had the 20... You know, he should have retired at 20. 20 straight matches undefeated. You should have stopped right there and just called it quits. But no, they had to, you know. And if you're, you know, let's let's say for the sake of argument, okay, the sh you, have to, uh, you have to break the streak. Somebody has to break the streak. The reason why I don't think it was Brock, it should have been Brock. Like, yeah, story-wise, story making Brock seem uh, powerful and un unstoppable made sense. Makes, uh, I can see the logic, but that... You didn't need to break the streak to show that. That was not necessary. You could have found so many other ways to do that. Hell, you wouldn't have had to have done it if you had actually had him beat John Cena when he first reappeared a few couple years ago, a couple years prior. Mm -hmm. Then you wouldn't even needed to make do something this stupid, you know. But there are a couple, several other people. Hell, even Adam Blompier made a better argument, even though I don't agree with it, with having John Cena be the one to break it. If you're going to do a John Cena heel turn, what better way to do it? But even I don't think that's exactly the best option. The point I'm I, making here is is that... Should have been Strowman. Should, yeah, honestly, yeah, 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 yeah. I, uh, yeah Strowman I, wasn't even around during this time. Here's when, the thing. When, oh, when, when Taker dropped a streak, he was in the company at the time, wasn't he? Mm, Not that I recall. If not he, that I recall. Not, not, not on it. Not on the main rosters. Yeah, hmm. I think he, he was still in the Indies at that point. He was still in OVW or like uh, in the ter developmental at the time. Okay. Because this was the time when Daniel Bryan finally, uh, when the Yes movie was in full swing. Yeah, uh, it was. It was. It was. Gonna so, be sorry, I've moment. I've had multiple concussions over the years, so the memory gets scrambled. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> um, like, but I just put someone else besides that, like. The thing about like uh, this is not defense. This is not defense. WWE uh, shades. At the time, for some magical reason, they thought Brock was the golden goose. With foresight, we all know. But Brock <laughs> was, and Brock was, and I am not defend. Was a very talented wrestler. Who came out. He would do moon salt. He looked great. But the moment he got that injury on his neck at the surgery, he changed as a human being and everything. He's like. Cash first, money, business, everything. I mean, the best way to describe his attitude is look what he did to New Japan. I mean, Anoki can be blamed too, but the way he was a horrible for that company's legacy. But yeah, uh, foresight, don't we shouldn't have been brought. But at the time, everyone was like, this is the future of our company. He's jacked, he's big, he's got blonde hair and blue eyes. God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the sad yeah. part is you're, you, that's the that's the part that angers me the most is that that whole uh, mentality. That's really what I think I started to realize about WWE during this during this lapse is that that was and, and, and I'm no I'm not the only one who said that uh, who believes think realize this because a lot of people on YouTube talk about this how you know as uh as Ross Twiddle has put it Vince McMahon makes big sweaty men. Like he has this idea, you can even to this day he still has this mentality of it has to be this larger than life, Adonis looking figure. When the modern wrestling fan doesn't want that so much anymore. I mean, yeah, sure, you can have people that look like that and make it work, but that's not the that's not the norm anymore. The norm is people like CM Punk and Daniel Bryan and Kenny Omega and all the you know these guys that are slimmer. You know, more you know, more normal looking, someone who they can relate to. You want to know what I find funny about about that about that whole him that whole him wanting 
the the um the six the six the six foot six guy, the six yeah. foot six bodybuilder is um. There's an there's a there's an ancient there's an ancient saying, one that one that I have repeatedly have to have to, have had to bring up as a wannabe historian that that I somehow have found myself into being. Those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Because let's not let's not forget, in the in the golden era, you had everybody at their at their largest, at their most ripped, and. There was the idea of going with with quote unquote smaller guys because of because of the, all because of all the scandals that were going that were going on. And there's also the fact that in the mid 2000s there were a, there were a bunch of hand, there were a bunch of hand picked people who th- who they thought who they thought were go- who they who were picked just because of their body, um, which you can blame John Laurinaitis for that. Uh, P- thanks, know, Johnny. Um, you know, people like Snitsky or or um, Luther Reigns or a lot of people who just did who just didn't last in the in the in the um, ruthless aggression era. Um, Hi, so, Nathan Jones. How you doing? <laughs> um, hey, son, don't, don't you just my boy Nathan? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Hey. Nathan, I'm sure Nathan Jones is a nice guy, and I'm, and I did enjoy seeing him get stabbed with a spear by Brad Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> but... hey, hey. I, I looked. I look. I laughed at, at him getting his head popped like a pimple in uh, the latest Mortal Kombat film as well, and told him directly, and he got a good laugh out of it. So, um... yeah, I, this, this is not me knocking him as a person, but let's be honest: is uh, there's a reason why he didn't last long in WWE? Look, <laughs> oh, oh yeah, he he was a typical yeah. Perth, he was a typical Perth trained wrestler, to be honest. And yeah. yeah, they don't exactly produce the top top level guys over there in Perth. So would would. You... Would it be fair of me to say that Perth is the um, Australian equivalent to the power plant? Yeah, they do have a very particular style. Everybody's going to be ripped and jacked over there. But, you know, what do you expect when the only other thing you can do over in Perth is mining, so... Okay, which I guess I, I guess I could get, but there's not a whole lot to do in te- in Texas, and you didn't have that problem with world class. You just had well, yeah, but, te- but te- te- Texas is, is well... To be honest, Perth is like the equivalent of going out to Nevada. Pretty much, mostly desert area out there, dude. All right, fair. Just ne- Nevada without the Vegas Strip. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh. and, and and to be fair, there's a lot of local promotions in Texas. I mean, look at all the all the Texas boys that came out of there. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But. Them good old boys. Yeah. But yeah. I, it, to, to to bring it back around to the point that I was making is like, yeah. I think Monk's hit the nail on the head there. Basically, Vince, uh, Mix McMahon Jr., and I will stress that Jr. till the day I die because, God damn it, he hates it, and I want to piss him off. <laughs> <laughs> but Jr. has had it in his head that he has been trying and desperately to find the next Hulk Hogan. He wants to find someone that he can place up as the face of the WWE, as the guy that you built the whole company around when... That doesn't work anymore. Let's let's use. I know this might be a bit of a stretch, but let's use UFC as as a um as a point of comparison. And I ended I ended up making this comparison during that time when they were really trying to push Roman Reigns as the next John Cena. Um. Consider consider some consider the guys who have who have been the who have been the top who have been the top draws in UFC over the last twenty years. Um, Chuck, um, whether, whether it be, you, going all the way back, you had, um, you had Iceman Chuck Liddell and the, and beyond, beyond that, beyond that, you had guys like, um, Frank Mir, Alistair Overeem. Um, I, obviously he asked Brock Lesnar for a hot, for a hot minute, although I'd say his UFC personality and his WWE personality are polar opposites of each other. Um. Then um, Anderson Silva, which is um, <laughs> which is a story for another day, but the point is, eat with each of them. Yeah, they, yeah, they were cer- they were certainly big guys and certainly on that heavyweight heavyweight end of things, but none of them were exactly what you would call cookie cutter, and that's not even getting into <laughs> that's not even getting into um, to the to the bad to the um, bad guy himself, Chael Chael Sonnen or Tito or um, Tito Ortiz. Especially, especially Chael, especially Chael son and Mister um, Mighty Mouth himself. Oh, 
but all all of those all those particular guys were di were different from each other. There is there is this idea there is this idea in a lot of in Hollywood and other places that that of this um per, of trying to find this perfect formula for uh, for a successful film, for instance. The problem is that perfect formula doesn't exist, so people use stupid ones. The only t the only time anybody ever did a it did anything close to a perfect formula in any in any form of entertainment is Moneyball, and that didn't e and that didn't even work. <laughs> Long story there. Go go watch the film Moneyball, or just or just or just look up Billy Bean when when it came to what he did with the Oakland A's. But the but the point the point is is that when you, is that by trying by trying to assume that there's this per that there's this perfect foolproof template um ignores ignores the fact that wrestling is very very dependent on playing to an audience even more so than arguably any other form of enter any uh, form of entertainment outside of um sta outside of stage acting and even that's a stretch and there are different kind of an, there are different kind of audiences for different kind of works especially especially when you look at the things that say the territories would always um special would always emphasize like each te each territory back in those days had their own thing that they that they that they featured more than anything else largely as a reflection of their audience but when you try and when you try and force an audience into a certain mold it's go it's going to it's going to strike back at you which is the reason why you have things like crowd hijacking But, and of, and of course, I think, I think what, I think the, it's funny that we brought up the, um, the yes movement thing, because I think, I think for a lot of people, that was where it was really highlighted, because first off, it's a bad idea to, to point out flaws in your baby face. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but, se but second off, the focus was not, was, was much, was much less about what it should have be, that being. Win, that being winning, winning the um, u winning the unified championship, and instead was about the face of the company and what and the face that is good for business. And the and the and the whole B plus player and 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 all that and all that kind of thing. And to bring this even to bring this point even further home, consider what um consider what Road Dog has said. On Corey Graves' podcast a few years ago, when talking about Adam Cole, that baby. Yeah, baby. yeah, 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 yeah. That was sorry, sorry. You, you got to do that. You got to do that right. If you're going to say that name, you got to put baby at the end of it. <laughs> yeah, I got a like, title quest. Yeah, but if basically basically saying that if only had if only had the body of Karrion Cross, he'd be a main roster star, which is one of those cases <laughs> of what's not said. What was the was the Real damning part. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And I, I suppose I should get, I suppose I should get into what was my final nail, because for the longest time, the closest um, escape that escape that I had that I had within WWE, and they were already hanging on by a thread. I bit the only t the only time I really engage is w is listening to um, Solomonster sounds off because and and um the Brian and Vinny show because. And it's less. It's less about the. It's less about WWE and more about the fact that I enjoy those personalities. Oh <laughs> uh, no, I, I love Solomon's Monsters podcast. I still listen to this day. But Brian and Vinny, I. I feel Brian is slowly. Every time I listen, I worry he's losing his mind. Every 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 podcast, I worry his. Uh, he's doing, his sanity is just gone. He's doing better than he was doing when he was watching TNA pay per views every month. <laughs> Minus five stars. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> Minus. Like, five. <laughs> Like I've I've seen I've seen I've I've seen my fa I've seen those particular years. Hell, a, hell, a few weeks ago we did a whole we did a whole thing of ranking ranking twenty years of minus five stars matches. <laughs> oh lord. Uh, and um, yeah, a lot of them, a lot of those, T a lot of those worst TNA matches got got on there, of course, and a few, and a couple of dishonorable mentions from CMLL. Um. But the th but the thing but the thing is my I loved um the black the black and gold era of N of NXT 
when they when they moved it over to full when they moved it over to full sail and they were and they slowly built it built it up from a from the from <laughs> this development from this developmental project into a, into this he, into this heavy metal infused um in indie thing so bring it on the light yeah it, yeah essentially it pretty, it pretty much was trying to it pretty much was trying to do that and i i was a little bit worried when i saw when i saw the um collaborations that they were trying to do with icw progress and ev and um evolve but i but i had the but um but because of because of the strength of the matches that i kept seeing at every takeover i did i was able to let i was able to let that slip because there were because well there's there's some really damn good matches through through that era but yeah. um then when the, when they decided to move the thing onto USA to try and start a Wednesday night war and and move the thing live to 2 hours that's when i re that's when i realized that there were gonna, there was going to be trouble and then i started seeing them hot shotting mm -hmm. and i'd i'd say i'd say the fi the final nail was was the, was the whole carrion cross running through everybody now i've known Car i've known I've liked Carrying Cross's work, like I liked him when he was ki when he was Killer Cross in Impact. But the problem is when you when you do that whole run through everybody is event is that has a very short shelf life, and eventually you're gonna run yourself dry of people who can reasonably challenge. You see, and of and of course once um once NXT 2.0 happened, I'm like, well that's it, I'm I'm out. I d I was I was only I was humoring you up to this time, but I don't. But you need me more than I need you. <laughs> yeah, and to get back to the hot shotting, what made it bad is like you killed a lot of the formula make NXT good because if we try to compete with another show, mm -hmm. what the strength of the strength of NXT came from the, it was a short show, it was easy to watch. You had the whole point of watching NXT on TV was to get to the takeovers, which was well worth it because you built a story for a takeover. Your takeovers happened once every two months, I believe, or maybe a quarter, and you would go, and then you watch three months of television, you got a payoff for it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah. what the hell are they doing? Like, for example, um, we decided to break up Undisputed Era just because of the ratings. Now we got this. We brought back Finn. Like, every, it was so random every week. I remember one week, when Cody and Wardlow had the uh, steel cage match, next week later we got two steel cage matches. The fuck are you doing? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's the the big problem is it, it, there. There's gonna be a, a summary point I'm gonna make about the difference between these two between WWE and AEW by the end of this, mm -hmm. but. It it really you know there, there's this it, you, honestly I think what it is is that WWE has taken the worst aspects of the past instead of taking what was working. You they've taken the worst parts of the golden era with the need of having the next Hulk Hogan. You've taken the worst aspects of the Attitude Era that need of shock television, con constantly ch change thing, you know, constantly do big whole big surprises to keep people engaged. They've taken the worst aspects of the ruthless aggression era, just constantly pushing pushing certain people when it was very clear it's not working. Just every era has had its problems, and these and these days it seems like they've taken the worst of all of them and combined them into one uh, just massive mess. I'd say yeah. I well, I I'd go I'd go even one step further. They've also taken the worst aspects of um, WCW. That yeah. be, that being um that being an that being an over reliance on this on a very small handful of people in your in your main events, mm -hmm. and most of them have being the wrestlers who have been around for God knows how long, and it should have should be already at the point of stepping it's, back and letting the new guys step up. It's the fact yeah. that we're that we're still seeing matches today that we saw ten years ago, mm -hmm. in the in the same spot on the card in the, the same title matches. Like, have an over-reliance of the glory years. And even back when these guys were new, like, Edge was coming up, Cena was coming up, Randy Orton was coming up, you'd see them against each other over and over and over again. And it just, it wears. And it's not even the fact that they do something like, 
oh, they're in a tag match or they're in something. It's no, we got like three straight shows of, oh, we'll have Cena versus Edge main eventing for the title on three shows week after week. No, that's not how you do it. One of the biggest things, and I'll I'll give this to uh, Raven who said this, that wrestling is a roller coaster ride. You have your peaks and you have your valleys. Mm-hmm. Long term booking is a is should not be a dirty word. You know, take a look at Hulk Hogan versus Sting in WCW. They didn't have those guys touched for a year. Yeah, I know the match The match was absolute dog bollocks at the end of the day because, you know, Sting was out of shape for a year when the guy should have been training for a year for this thing. Mm-hmm. And, and Hulk Hogan was playing his and, political card and, again. And Hogan was playing his usual political BS. But the anticipation of, of that match was at such a fever pitch that it should have been one of the top all-time matches and it's one of those feuds where you look at it and you go the reason why i want to pay why i'm throwing money at the screen to to get these guys on television is because of that anticipation now uh what was it uh i think it was like a u.s title match i heard about the the other week uh sheamus and somebody else they did a pay-per-view and then they did a rematch the exact same match the exact same everything I think it was after Extreme Rules. They did it the same same thing on Raw the next night. What? So what's the point of buying the pay-per-view? What was the point of building up a feud if you're going to give it away for, on free television later? What speaking the, of speaking of that, do you think do you think do you think that um do you think that they've been a little bit over reliant on on the rematch clause that they love using? Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, well, and tr- well and truly because it results in the idea that why should i bother getting the pay-per-view when i'm going to get it on raw the next night exactly. or i'm going to get it on smackdown the next night take a look at like we're going to end up doing the comparisons anyway look at the way aew has been booking their pay-per-views versus the way wwe treats it sure aew only does a pay-per-view once every three or so months wwe does one every month mm-hmm. at this point it's oversaturation for one and two, a lot of people are like, okay, well, I'm getting this on the network for nine ninety nine. Why should I bother watching? Whereas AEW, because they build build the anticipation over months. When they get to pay per view, how many people are throwing fistfuls of dollars at their TV screen or their computer screen or whatever, going, "Give me this match. It's money." Right. Yeah, it, it, we, we, it, we 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 have we have this chat that we do on on Wednesdays and Fridays. Just a so, small select group of us that watch AEW. Mm-hmm. The amount of times that we will sit there and we see somebody come in and go, "Okay, they're building this feud. Don't give it to me on television. Make me pay for it." And that's the way you should be working wrestling as a business. Yeah, if you're no, not working for that pay-per-view where we have to throw an extra 20, 30 bucks at the screen, then you're not doing your job properly. If somebody's going, oh, well, I'm not going to bother watching WWE Extreme Rules because they're going to give me half the matches for free on Raw the next night, then obviously you're doing something wrong. Honestly, oh, yeah. I think I think the WWE Network was, brought, was honestly one of the biggest mistakes WWE ever made because of mm-hmm. how much damage it has done to the overall product. Well... <laughs> Let's see. At the time, they did it because they did the pay per view model didn't work for them, and it has been working for a while. And because of the fact is again rematch clause, etc. Like at, this was around the later time. It, it, the death of WWE, which I really do feel a bit, is the fact is the reliance on the old people to save their company rather than build on new guys. I mean, I, I'm sorry. We live in a world where Aleister Black, former Aleister Black, and the former Buddy Murphys was not pushed enough to consider a draw. That match they had at that pay-per-view that I did not steal from was actually good. I saw color on a WWE product. The <laughs> color, Jesus Christ! <laughs> but but like how many how many times have we seen Goldberg trotted back out? He wasn't even a WWE product. They trot him out as a show horse every now and again to make money. Exactly. Like and, and nobody on? cares anymore. They they want us. They want to see guys 
and a lot of it also comes up with uh, the transition from NXT. Karrion Cross, let's bring him back as yet yet again another example. Dude can work. His gimmick in NXT with his his uh, with his misses in in the tight leather, you know, getting half of his entrance, it worked. But so was it? What happens when they bring him up on on Raw? I think they put him in as a as a lost member of um, Demolition. Yeah. Just in in red leather bondage gear. It's like, what the hell are you doing? These guys have gimmicks that work in NXT, and you bring them onto Raw, and you give them a gimmick that doesn't work because mm-hmm. Vince McMahon doesn't like what happens on NXT. NXT is small time to him. And it's I, like mm, suppo- <sighs> supposedly, supposedly he or one or one of his flunkies had called it um, flippy shit. Um, uh, that was Bruce Pritchard. I'm being serious. I know it was, it was yeah, Bruce Pritchard. Yeah, that, that sounds like uh, a yeah. yeah that, so, that sounds that sounds like, and that's. I'll be honest. When a, although I know a lot of wrestlers have um, have been doing podcasts, but Pritchard is the one that I refuse to listen to because I cannot take him at his word. No, um, he is very he is a very self serving man, and believes that he is the reason why wrestling exists today. So he is a bit of an egotist, but unfortunately, like when guys like that who know how to play the political game backstage and have Vince's ear, then you have the real talent, the road agents, ha- having a harder time getting a better product out there. And that's why half of them leave for another company. You know, that's why AEW got a ton of really good road agents right now. Mm-hmm. Now, with with that kind with that kind of thing in mind, I sh- I um. I feel I feel that there's there's one other, there's one other um one other, one other, one other bit one other bit that I sh- that I should note cuz around the around the time that I started drifting away from um cuz there was a there was a point in time where I I was doing a watch along with my with myself and a dear and a dear friend of mine of Raw, SmackDown and and Impact every week and I did this for about it for about 11 months straight um, just just dive just diving head just diving head first back in after the, after the summer of punk but event but eventually it's it was a case of seeing seeing bad wrestling on one on one spot and seeing and seeing um and, and seeing ca- seeing bad ca- seeing bad camera work especially since I've told you this before shades but I and you're you've seen you've seen this firsthand I have issues with light yeah. Oh. Mm-hmm. I have to I have to wear sunglasses anytime it's br- anytime it's bright and sunny out. Otherwise, I get headaches. And the combin after after a bit of time, the combination of the of the very brightly lit style of of WWE comb- combined with the with the obsessive amount of camera cuts that Kevin Dunn insists on. <laughs> Uh, excuse me. You need to call his real name Buck Two Fever Boy. That's his real name. <laughs> Thank you. Don't, yeah. Fine. Miss Mr. So. Mr. Go to two, two, go to three, go to four, go to five, go to three. Yeah, there, 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 there. You know, a few years ago, I I watched a um, I watched a clip from a documentary that Jackie Chan w- had done when he was talking about how to do action comedy, and one mm-hmm. of the things that he really, really doesn't care for. Is um is ca- is camera cuts in action scenes? Because the way the way he described it is Im- imagine imagine the camera showing up showing a punch and then it imme- and then just before the punch is supposed to land on whoever it's hitting, it immediately cuts to an off screen so you don't see the punch actually land. And he described it as you're as you having you having to blink because you're you're um you're you're being taken out of the f- out of the flow of what you're seeing for a split second, it may be a split second, but after that, your brain has your brain has to get that momentum train right back on, and that's how I de- that's how I end up feeling about these zoom in and outs and the and the ca- and the obsessive camera cuts where there's like one every every set every second and a half, and it actually it actually started to give me um legit headaches. <laughs> I I shouldn't have to take Tylenol to watch wrestling. But I, I would. 
but I remember, I remember something. I remember. I, I, I don't know. We usually, we usually take whiskey and bourbon when we watch it. So you know. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa! Don't, don't be, don't be screwing my, my, you know, my medical needs for watching WWE, right? Jeez, don't give it everybody. God. But no, no, no. The, the worst part about it though is like it's so excessive to a point that it's like, how to put this? I have nothing against WWE's. Um, like high production value, and everything. I have a problem with how they use the production because they use everything in else to not focus on the thing they're doing. You're a effing wrestling show. Please have some decent wrestling product. Like you have to focus on in the camera, the workers, everything. Like I don't well, understand that. Okay, as someone who actually does video production on wrestling shows, I can tell you. Like the way WWE does it, it is like watching a television production because that's the way they treat it. They treat it like they're filming a, they like, a sitcom they like or a movie. Movies. Or, yeah, they yeah. make they're trying to make movies. Whereas when I go to when I go and do a show as a camera guy, I usually work ringside. We have three cameras. We have two ringside cameras, and we have the hard cam. The hard cam picks up majority of the action. The the we have one uh, ringside camera which does one side of the ring and then another one on the opposite side of the ring with one of those cameras doubling for entrances. Now, I don't know if it's the fact that because I have wrestled, I know what to watch out for. I know the cues. I know the little tricks. But whenever I've been at ringside... I always tell the guy who does the editing at the end of the day, I will have a majority of the emotion shots. This is when a wrestler is in, uh, say, a submission hold, and they're screaming, they're scratching for the ropes. I will get right in, I'll get right at the edge of the ring and zoom in and slowly pan out so it shows the emotion in what they're doing to, to pull the drama. You don't need 17 camera cuts to show that. You need one guy with a zoom function. Yeah. Wait, much. wait. Back, oh, back up. Uh, Mace, you know that shit you just described? Is they do that every time Zack Sabre Jr., Taichi, or any wrestler of New Japan pull a sixth submission hold. They always do that exactly mm -hmm. what you just described. All the time. Yeah. It always gets me. Yeah. Holy yeah. shit. That's what it is. And, and, and the thing is, one of the things that I, I made a habit of was I would talk with the wrestlers before the match and I'd say, have you got any high spots you want captured? Like anything, like if you got something where you're going to pull something on a, like try and choke somebody with a rope and you want a certain reaction, in which case I will break with tradition. I will go in front of the hard cam to capture the shot on the person's face. And I'll turn around and say, you're going to have to edit that shit, tough shit. <laughs> um, but the one that I, I actually worked, I've worked on a couple of shows and... I actually got um, a, bit, a little bit of feedback from Sabu about this was the fact that I was able to take a bit of a, a chance parking myself right next to the ring apron, crouching down and catching somebody jumping over the top rope right over my head through a table. Mm -hmm. Wow. I put myself at risk, but because I had talked to Sabu and uh, Mad Dog, the guy that was, he was wrestling that night, and I was told... Sit here, get this shot. It'll look spectacular. And the thing is, I'm a guy with a single handheld camera, and I'm pulling off shots and getting what is the emotional depth of wrestling without having to have the big production that WWE does. Why? Because I look out for what wrestling does. I'm not, I'm not here to make television. I'm here to put over a wrestling event. And I think that's where, where WWE has lost its way, is that they're trying to be more television than a wrestling production. And again, well, this is where AEW is starting to the funny show thing, that they're, they're I, filming I, wrestling. The funny thing about Actually, that whole television thing... Sorry, sorry to cut you off, Shades, but I gotta, I gotta bring this up. The funny thing about that television thing is that a few years ago, there was a show that came, that came around that was, that was strictly designed to be a television show that didn't have those, ba that didn't have those bad habits. It was called Lucha Underground. Oh that, yeah, that oof, good times. Yeah, indeed, indeed. But the point I was going to make to to play off of that, the it comes back to a very big point that WWE has stressed, and it really does uh, uh, emphasize the We're whole sports story. entertainment. Damn it! There it is, right there, right there. 
Yeah, sports entertainment. They're not wrestling. As far as WWE is concerned, as far as Junior is concerned, they are not a wrestling promotion. They are sports entertainment. And, and they've even mocked this themselves. Hi, Paul Heyman. How you doing? You've said yourself, Paul. You know, you made fun of the whole thing. And yet here you are contributing to the very thing you'd mocked. Yeah, but we know Paul Heyman loves the paychecks. So, you know. I mean, yeah. as, as, he, as he says, give you Jew a shekel, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. God. Uh, look at this way. If Paul Heyman was not in WWE, I know he would be hiding for the rest of his life. That's all I got to say about it, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, be, yeah. yeah, yeah, but the point is, yeah, that's that's the bigger problem with with WWE as a whole is that they aren't trying to be wrestling, and it shows. Hell, mm. I think if Junior had his way, he'd ditch the wrestling altogether. But he also knows he can't do that because that's the whole core. That's the biggest uh, thing that draws. We're, Except he doesn't know how to. That, park that is indeed true. We are not yeah. wrestling. Says the guy. Says the guy who who. Who, ha who has wrestling commentators watching a wrestling match in a wrestling ring with a wrestling au with a wrestling audience with wrestling in the name of his company? And yeah, Not wrestling. Do you, what do you hold, 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 hold. Those lines sound, sound familiar. The, the, those guys that sounded familiar. That was um, that wouldn't have to be Joey Styles back in the day, would it? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, that no. promo by that man sounded very familiar to what you just said. <laughs> I will, I will, I will, I will write it off as imitation is the sincerest form of flattery and move on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll take. We've been on this for it. too long. We got. We got to get to the next part yeah. of this. But to get to get to get to the other end of the spectrum. Now, I I will I will admit, um, after 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 that, I ended up I ended up focusing large largely on ROH and. What I could of um of new of New Japan, um, which was, which which um was how I which how I discovered the the people that would end up becoming the three musketeers, and I ended up becoming a massive mark for um, Katsuyori Shibata. Um, Yo, the wrestler. Yeah, the wrestler. Yeah. Um, uh, but then um then a little event called Global Wars happened. You know, War of the War, War of the Worlds, and Glo and Global Wars. This interpromotional thing, and I was too I was too young for the interpromotional things from the territory days. So I, so the idea of doing this of doing that kind of event, I was all in on that from the get go, and through and through that, I ended up I ended up delving more and more into, um, into what I could with New Japan, and th and of course then there was the pay-per-view that was a collab with um global force <laughs> yeah <laughs> In global force shit show god oh god uh, at the very at the very i will give the devil its due at the very least it allowed a lot of people who had never seen um new japan before to see it for the first time um but but after after that and see and seeing what um and seeing the event that is wrestle kingdom i ended up diving headfirst into New Japan, and I make the, I make I make it a point to try to try and watch um, Wrestle Kingdom every, every year, Rest, Wrestle Kingdom <laughs> and Dominion every every year. Um, Sometimes the un the unfortunate part is that is that in re in um in the in a lot of those years I end up watching them on Japan time because I don't hate myself enough. <laughs> Why would you, you know what? It, you do, it's, buddy. It's it's not that bad here in Australia. We're only one hour ahead of Japan, so <laughs> watching Wrestle Kingdom wasn't that bad for me. I it had started like six PM and end at midnight, so Well, I'm I'm in I'm in I'm in Minnesota in the US. So <laughs> Uh early, early, early AM to what the hell am I doing up at this time of morning? Yeah. But then I but um because of the fact that I started getting inundated more and more with with what was going on in the indies, then I and um that was how that was how I started seeing stuff like Chikara, stuff like um PWG, so, um I've, obviously I've already mentioned ROH, but also stu also stuff like Evolve and and a lot of the other a lot of the other larger named indies, not just the um not just the small time stuff I was looking at in Minnesota, even though I have a I have a soft spot for the Davari brothers, um. But then, then I then um then I end up here. I end up and I'd already I'd already enjoyed um the Young Bucks and what I had seen of 
um, Kenny Omega. But then, I but then I start he then I start hearing about this gentleman's bet, <laughs> and and um obviously I had I had seen all in. In fact, I had I had um contributed to a review of it, and at the time I thought it was just going to be a mega show and that would, and that'd be it, um, and then I and then. I, and then, of course, everybody starts hearing about this AEW thing, which I had heard—I had heard of up, of Upstart promotions here, here and there. But uh, and I, I was willing to watch it as a as a see how long it lasts. But as t as time went on, as the realization started to come, this is so this is something that is that is not going to be some fly by night. No, now I think we should at least give for those who have not like followed the story of AEW. A little brief uh, history of its of its origin story. Because I think we'd have to it, start it with is, the gentleman's bet. Yes. For now, mm. for those who don't know, basically, uh, th uh, Cody Rhodes and the Young Bucks, as well as Kenny Omega, had been you know working together a lot in different indie scenes, mainly in New Japan and a couple of the places. And I think it was uh, who? It was Meltzer who made the bet. It was Meltzer. Yeah, Meltzer jokingly made a bet. That they could not that they could not put together a pay per view to that would or put put together an event that would sell more than ten thousand seats. Mm -hmm. Cody took that bet and sold out those ten thousand seats in like what less than a day. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, when all in when all in was announced as this um as this as this super card um of of all these different indie shows um. It ended, it ended up going up really damn quick, especially since this was this was when being the elite was really blowing up. Yeah. So they they had a that Meltzer quickly ate his words on that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so at with the success of all uh, of all in and everything they they took that momentum and ran with it. Hence why they called their their follow up pay per view Double or Nothing. And again, sold out even quicker this time around with a larger capacity, especially when they were bringing in guys like Chris Jericho to really punch things up. Mm -hmm. So that was when they decided to go literally all in on making a W with the introduction with Tony Khan stepping in to basically help fund the fund this uh, new project. Oh. And uh, to say Tony Khan has become the savior of wrestling these days uh, wouldn't be that far of a stretch. <laughs> And some something something that is that should be noted when it comes to the Khan family is that this is that um this is this is not they're not some they're not they're not it would be hard to, it would be hard pressed to say that they're a that they're a money mark obviously um, Tony Khan is the son of Sahid Khan who is the who is the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars as well as I believe one I believe I believe um one um London FC team. I don't I don't call I don't recall the specifics because I'm not I'm not going to say I'm that much of an expert on the on the um football leagues in the UK. And I follow a few things and I'll make fun of Chelsea any day of the week, but I'm not that much of an expert. Right. But the but the now of course the, then the I do want I do have to issue a slight correction on on you shades because the pay per view the pay per view immediately after all in was um all out. Oh, um, okay. I got my I got my names mixed up. Double double or That's nothing was smaller. the was the first AEW proper pay per view. But That's between that fair. there was there was that press conference in Jacksonville. Which is where a lot where a lot of people got re got um reintroduced to to a lot of the stuff that Jericho was doing, especially since he was Starting to re starting to reinvent himself as this king as this King Diamond trip tribute guy with um the pain maker gimmick. <laughs> Apparently, not enough people have br have brought up the fact that the whole face paint and the and the spikes thing he was doing. He's doing he's doing fucking King Diamond. Because because Jer because let's because let's not forget Jericho is a massive metalhead. But this but. You did. You did have. You did have the big four at this press conference, but you also had some. You also had some names that were that were brought that were brought up that were some of some of them. I'd say a lot of people did not know about at the time, and also doing this through their vignettes because they had they already had an understanding of how to work YouTube. Um, yeah. 
Now, I had known of... There was a couple of names that I had known of. Chief among them was um, Adam Page. Like I had, I had seen him in Ring of Honor when he was when when he was a when he was a Green Boy, and I'd seen him come up as a member of Decade, which incidentally also had pink and black as their primary colors. <laughs> a bit of an odd coincidence there. <laughs> but I had, but I had, um, but. Darby Allen, I was not familiar with at all, and both of the I bring up both of those names because those are standouts right now in that in that company, and a lot of a lot of people when they saw had making a had made a meme of the whole ex wrestler is all elite, but but there are a lot of people who were just writing it off as a t shirt company because they had a close association with pro wrestling tees, but. What, but uh, what I'd like to what I'd like to get is get the vibe of is um the react is the reaction that the rest of you had when it came to when it came to the aftermath of All In and the um pr- and the press conference in Jacksonville because those are two crucial moments. All right. Well, for me, I like I actually just I haven't really like I've only I've been only been able to go back because I only recently became a convert to uh, AEW, mm-hmm. but I did go back and I watched All In, which yeah, it lives up to the hype. It was an amazing show, mm-hmm. uh, and <laughs> with some interesting moments. Uh, hi, Joey Ryan. How you doing? <laughs> Good God, that moment was freaking ridiculous. Uh, so I haven't seen the original All Out. Uh, but I did see clips of the of the uh, of the press conference, and right away the vibe you get from the AEW uh, crew is there's a passion there that I had not seen from a wrestling promotion in decades. Like not even guys, I've seen clips of ROH, I've seen clips of in, I've seen a little bit of Impact here and there, I've seen clips of other promotions, but. The level of passion and love that you would see from AEW, even in its earliest of days, was unbelievably high. And it's something that I think is what really got people's attention. You know, you can do, you can put on the, you can have the big names, you can have the big matches, you can have the, the those unforgettable moments. But the general, the general vibe of love and passion is something that you will feel. And that, to me, I think was a bigger draw than anything they could have done. Oh. Crow, uh, hmm. Mace, what, what about you What about you two? Um, uh, did, you so, up, did you end up watching that press conference? Uh, yeah, I did. I First, I thought it was honestly, like most of my life is a joke. I thought it was a meme that they were just like, yes, we're having this and make t-shirts, but no, it wasn't. I think what he really did is set the playing field of like how... This is a new wrestling product. We're going to be real. And they gave multiple pay-per-views at the time. Fight for the Fall and being free. I think I've still... Yeah, I have seen all four of those pay-per-views before. The pre-TV AEW days. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting how they built their buzz. By actual good marketing uh, from for each event. Fight for the Fallen was held at Community Effort Orlando, run by Alex Jabaley, a person famous in the fighting game community and gaming community. Mm -hmm. So... Putting your tournament, th- putting sorry, putting a tournament, putting your show there within that vicinity allowed a more vibrant younger audience who may be in wrestling or watch wrestling. I mean, you got people there play fighting games or video games. We all know if you're playing video games, you're you're into a sub a different subculture. You're going to be into subculture things, and by art by marketing directly to that subculture in a way that you're there at their event was just brilliant. And you gave it free to people. Good stuff. Um. And I think that was like their, the beginning of how I see AEW market themselves versus the WWE, uh, Vince, Vince, whatever you call himself these days. And notice how they market directly to people in their facilities in their own way. Like, it's just like the way they did that. And I feel like this is going to be very, something different from the people they picked up. This is going to be a very different product from how they put their promos, how they built their matches. I mean, we had a triple Hadouken spot, for God's sakes. Mm-hmm. We had a show where Kenny Omega cosplay as Sans, and he paid Toby Fox to actually do the music, to use their music and draw an animated uh, GIF sprites, uh, I'm sorry, animated pixels, making a shout-out to his time in New Japan. 
this is going to be a very different show from its interesting entirety and 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 going directly towards the subculture people to that audience definitely knew what they were doing and i definitely definitely was like watched intently since then on because like these guys are not like you know, they're not your grandpa's wrestling company this is your wrestling company mm-hmm. they care about what you think what you want the wrestlers you may like to see you know mm-hmm. except a nightmare collective you know thank god that the other one i didn't want to see that but thank god it's it off the tv yeah like putting putting aside putting aside the putting aside the um the nightmare the nightmare collective I th- um, crow. What crow? What um? What about you? Um. Wait, crow. I, I, I said that. That was me. It's me. Yeah, me. Sorry. It's this is what this is what happens when you're when you're multitasking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm about to say like, oh man, like whoa, 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 whoa. Like, have I multiplied twice? Am I, am I now the Australian? Finally. <laughs> <laughs> uh. To, to be honest, I didn't really catch much of the hype for the original, uh, the the original All In show. Like, I didn't see like the press conferences or anything like that. It was actually a few months prior. Uh, I actually got the chance to meet and have a talk with Christopher Daniels, and he said, "Oh, I'm going to be on this card in the next couple of months, working this Cody show." I reckon it's probably going to be pretty cool. Like, there's a lot of people coming up, and it seems it's just going to be a really fun time. I'm like, oh, okay. So Cody and who else? He's like, oh, yeah. Like, you 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 watch New Japan? I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, you know, the Bullet Club. Oh, cool. All right. So Kenny Omega, Young Bucks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's like, yeah, it should be worth a watch. And that's that's how I actually found out about it. And I went and I put my 20 bucks down for the event and from the from the get-go it was just that you you had you could feel this electricity through the screen like you could you could feel that there was a change in the air that this was not going to be like i've i've watched that many fly-by-night companies come and go i've seen pay-per-views that have been one-off events and stuff like that this from start to finish felt so different like that this was that that fresh breath of wind that was going through the air that makes you go by the end by the time you will watch finish watching this show you are going to be wanting to see more of what we can give you mm-hmm. and hey they didn't disappoint from start to finish that was an absolutely brilliant show and i'm like okay let's see what happens next because I'm sitting there and they've got ideas going. And I think from there they went to, it was like an all, they did all in and they did all out. And mm-hmm. uh, I think it was at the end of all out where you had John Moxley show up. Um, Moxley didn't if show I, up until double or nothing. Double, double or nothing. Yeah. yeah. So I, w- I was watching those every time those shows came up. I'm like, sure, I'll hope I'll throw down twenty bucks. I've got no problems supporting what is a good idea. And when Moxley showed up, I think that's when my eyes just got glued to it. I'm like, this is going to be more than just a few shows that they're putting on for the hell of it. Like they're now starting to work storylines, so there's something big coming from this. And then they announced AEW, and I'm like, I'm down. I'll give it a go. I'll give it a chance. I'll start watching. Uh, unfortunately, like outside of the pay per views, where I'm, I was happy to drop money on Fight TV to watch them. I had no access to the TV shows when they first started, mm-hmm. so I couldn't watch Dynamite when it first started through legal means. I had to watch them via third party websites, and I got I got hooked from there. And I eventually found out that, they, yes, they are putting it on Fight TV for internationals. Pay $7 a month and you can watch Rampage and Dynamite Live. And I'm like, sure, 7 bucks a month for a couple of shows? I'm good. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it was just that, that first night, that all-in event, from, from start to finish, it felt like that there was this this change, this electricity that I hadn't felt as a wrestling fan in decades. 
and, and you could tell it by the guys in the ring. They were loving every minute that they were doing, every spot that they did, the matches that they had. These guys were smiling. They were happy. They were putting in 110% into to putting on their best matches. And even guys that I had never seen before, I started to, to see as great characters who have amazing futures. You know, this was the first time that I had seen Maxwell Jacob Freeman, a.k.a. the fucking heel god, work. <laughs> I swear to God, the second that man opened, like, like opened his mouth, money, money. Yeah. It, it was like it was like watching Okada make money rain from the sky. That's what that's what MJF was to me in that moment. Mm-hmm. If if I may, kind of help steer the ship a little, Mildred. I think this would be a good point for us to kind of steer into what makes AEW worth, like, what has caused AEW to become this big draw. Yeah, and for me. One one of the things that I said very early on when I when I was um when I was watching is it very much feels like I'm watching a variety show. In the in the sense that if you if you look at when you if you look at some um, if you look at something like Raw, matches are formatted lar- largely the, largely largely the same. A, a lot of heat, one 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 comeback for a few seconds, a lot of stalling. And then and then go and then go to the finish, you know, the kind of the kind of thing that you, the kind of thing that you might see in a house show in the eighties, right? <laughs> whereas, whereas um, with a with AEW, we are see we are seeing we are seeing some matches that are going that are going to be ver- that are going to be very lucha centric. We're going to see we're going to we're going to see te- we're going to see tag matches. We're going we're going to be seeing. Um, t- we're we're going to be seeing technical. We're going to be seeing hardcore. They're not af- they're not afraid to divvy up the style of the matches. Even if they they have they've been very conservative about gimmick matches, like in ter- in terms of in terms of ta- in terms of tag team or th- or three way or four way or six or a six or six pack or anything like that. And they've been smart enough to not touch the championship scramble. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> I feel like if I would try if I tried to explain the 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 way the rules were, for that thing were supposed to work, I think I'd be here till morning. <laughs> but it's the fact is the fact that you're always getting something different, and even, and this applies ju- this applies just as well to the um, comedy end of things. Like, can you honestly tell me that some that somebody like um, Orange Ca- Orange Cassidy? Could could work it could work in Junior's landscape. What with his whole gimmick being he's the laziest motherfucker in the room. Oh hell no! He went the last five minutes. They'd force him to change that gimmick. No, no, they would bury him and then make him change the gimmick. They'll 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 uh, trust me. They'll they, they'll hurt him first. Mm-hmm. Vince is all about breaking the spirit. If you heard of the former Tyler Black's interviews of how they keep correcting him and told him if you keep asking questions, he'll be fired. Yeah, they're about breaking your spirit more than making you work. So once they break your spirit. Then you give you a job. Yeah, <laughs> that's. <laughs> but the but hell the 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 idea the idea of doing a death match on television with Nick fucking Gage is is something is something that um that would have never that would have never occurred to me and this and the same and there's also the there's also the awareness of how um of how of of how smart the audience is to people's storylines outside of things i'd say i'd say a good example of this kind of thing is the is the one time as a as a bit of um as a bit of fan service john moxley comes out to wild thing Bas- basically is because he is because he was a massive fan of atsushi onita and that and that was his entrance in fmw but you you've got stuff like that. You have the you have the fact that some um, people that people are allowed to ex- to express their own, to express their own creativity on things, and because of that, you end up getting something different every week. So it doesn't feel watching watching Dynamite or watching Rampage does not feel like the same show every week. Exactly. Also, another big aspect that I've noticed in just in the short time I've started watching is that while yes. 
you know, you have your top stars. You've got Kenny Omega. You've got the Young Bucks. You've got Moxley. You've got Jericho. They don't aren't afraid to start building up the new talent. Like you look at Darby Allen, I think would be the perfect example of this. Darby Allen is clearly being set up to be a top star. Like he's going to be gunning for the championship before, by the end of this year. I, I can almost call it by mm-hmm. by, by December, he's going to be in a title contention because they are building him up to be a top star. At least that's the feeling I get watching him. Well, the matches that he gets set up. I mean, considering who he who 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 he was the first opponent of a certain wrestler I'll be talking about here in a minute. Yeah, that tells me more than enough that he is somebody that they trust to be the uh, big draw. And again, Darby Allen is somebody who would never get over in WWE. Not because right. of the fans. Fans would eat him up. But he they he'd never get pushed in WWE. The gimmick would hold him back in WWE. <laughs> Yeah. No, just his stature, just his physique would hold him back. But uh, as you were saying there, the Shade, so, oh, sorry, I had to stop, step away for a phone call, but um, that's the one thing I love about AEW in general is you get the ex-WWE guys coming in who are the big names, and they're instantly going, they're doing the, the Terry they're doing the Terry Funk in ECW thing. Ooh, I can make him. Ooh, let me work with him. I can make money. Let's do this because it's going to draw people to the audience. Yeah. You know, Jer- Jericho coming in and working with MJF straight off the bat. You know, yeah. that, that, that's making and building a future star while making money. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know, these guys, the guys like Jericho, Jericho knows he's a made man. People know who he is. He knows he could, unless he does something completely and royally dumb, he doesn't have to worry about his, his legacy anymore. He knows his legacy is set in stone. So he's going to take that and work with and help build other people up so that he can he won't be a low to the top, which is how it's supposed to work. That you build up the top stars, you give them their chance to shine, and then once they've hit once they've passed their peak, you use them to build up the next generation. That's how it's supposed to work, and AEW does, easily does that. If other you know, it, it's what makes me feel like every show is worth it because. I not only get to see my favorite, like my favorite wrestlers of the past, kicking ass, but I also get to see, hey, here's these all these new guys that look like they're doing really good. Hell, Matt Hardy, you know, he hit he he hit his peak during the Broken Era. Now that he, but now he's working on building up the the Matt, you know, the Matt Hardy office. He's getting up that mo- the Matt, money Matt Hardy office thing going up. He's got Private Party and all these other guys that he's building up for the, uh, under his name. He's using his name to build up other people, and it works. And that's some that's that brings us that brings us to one of the things that we ex- is seen extremely rarely in Junior Land, which is what I'm going to call it from here on in. Because if it's going <laughs> if it's going if it's going to if it's going to act like if it's going to act like a clown show, then it, at the very least should give it a clown name. <laughs> um, is managers because it, it's a very simple concept. If you got a guy who can't who can't talk or can't cu- or isn't going to be good at cutting a long promo, get him a mouthpiece to talk for him. Especially si- especially if they're a heel, so they can be a heat magnet if need be. Or or just or just to help somebody who ca- just to help somebody who isn't supposed to be that much of a talker. And there's a few there are a few na- there are a few names that I'm that I'm bringing up for this kind of thing. Obviously, one of them is um br- is bringing in Tully Blanchard to be the manager of Sean Spears. Oh. Um, the for, the former the, the former per, the former perfect ten, um, who 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 always who always struck me as as akin to um a Mister Perfect in the sense that he's somebody who can work with just about anybody. And yes, I may I will be a bit biased towards Kurt Henning because Minnesota boy. <laughs> I got until, until, until he drops, until he allegedly shits in your bag. Yeah, everyone loves Kurt Henning, allegedly. <laughs> God, God. The, the, okay, random, random tangent. The, the the ribs he did is legendary, but it's hard to believe that he actually took a shit in someone's bag. I don't know about that much, but God, oh. um, the cream uh, in someone's face. I can confirm that. Oh, jeez. <laughs> One of, the, one, of, one of my one of the guys that, that helped me out when I was first starting into breaking into Australian wrestling, uh, Chucky KLC worked a WWA show, and 
uh, he, he worked on the same show as Kurt and a few other guys. And, um, yeah, Kurt, ac- Kurt actually shit in his boots. Oh, my God! Buddy, <laughs> you're the best! You're the best, rest in peace! I love you. Uh, yeah. I guess he's done. Look, I'm going to pull my dusty impression. I love you! <laughs> <laughs> Good to peace. Oh, my God. That's so fucked, man. Yeah, oh. it, yeah I am well... I am well... I am well aware of... How, I'm well aware of how notorious of a ribber um, Kurt, Kurt Hennig was. And I... Unfortunately, I can't pass judgment given some of my... Given some of my exploits over the years. <laughs> you got... So you're gonna shit on us on this podcast? That's fantastic. Let me just step away from my mic. No, no, no. I've never, I've never shit in anyone's bag or anything like that. That's way too messy for me. I've done, stu- <laughs> I've done stuff like, um, set, like set up camouflage mouse traps. Ah. Uh. You know, paint, paint mouse traps the color of the, the color of the carpet floor and laid them out, or laid out a bunch of D fours on the kitchen floor. Wow, you fucking bastard! But you know what? Good, good shit. Good shit. <laughs> I'm not Pac. I'm too tall for that. <laughs> oh. speak. The, it's, the other, th- the other um, the other th- the other thing that I th- that I think is, I think I think is I think is worth getting going on the whole uh, manager thing. Um, obviously, the he- the heel wrestler and and manager co- combination is is one of those things that is virtually foolproof. Um. I'd s- but it's rare that it's rare that you'd s- but we do have we do have um a case of a baby face with a manager that is wor- that is worth discussing and that is in the case of um Sting and Darby Allen. Although, oh yeah. I think the I think the reason that ends up working is it's not a case of the typical manager approach but more of um mentor and student. Yeah. Like that that works extremely well because again it's another way of a guy who has made his name he's made his money mm-hmm. he comes into a, a company and the first thing he sees is somebody that reminds him of himself when he came came up in the business and he can see can be a big main event star and goes I want to work with him mm-hmm. like yeah. Sting could have come in run solo and done matches every now and again and but working with Darby. I reckon that's probably not only helped keep Sting in the spotlight, but is definitely a thing that is going to elevate Darby Allen over the years. Yeah, yeah, but it's not just the fact that you know Darby Darby Allen's not riding his coattails, nor is Sting riding Darby's. It's a case of there's a symbiotic relationship between those two, where it's keeping Sting relevant, like you said. At the same time, it's showing it's helping Darby get recognized, and now he's taking that and running with it. Like that promo he cut, like that co- that confrontation he had with MJF on Wednesday. Yeah, he can handle himself. Mm-hmm. He can prove that he can do. He can go. Like he can. He's he can. He already has shown he can wrestle like nobody's business, and now he can also show that he he can he can easily just be just as comp- good on the mic. Basically. Using his attitude, his personality, and running with it. They don't force him to go a certain way. He goes his own way in terms of how he cuts his promos. Very straight laced, very serious, not fa- not easily phased. I mean, even though he does have his weaknesses, like AMJF tried to exploit, but Darby's learned to deal with his demons, and he knows what he's got, he's capable of. Mm-hmm. So he doesn't let shit get to him that easily. And I love that. Yeah, and that's what that's what that's what makes it work. Um, something something else that I th- that I think I think we should we should bring up is is the is the fact that we only they are only doing four pay per views a year and they've pre- they pretty much already they pretty much already got the na- they pretty much already got the names down the only thing the only thing beyond that would be um would giving would be giving special titles to certain episodes of Dynamite like naming naming one of and those are for themed nights the same way that. Say a sports team might do might do retro night or or some other some other um, gimmick night. Um, well, that game that sort of harkens back to sort of older style things where, like uh, WCW used to do the well, it could end up being WWE as well. Uh, spin the wheel, make a deal. 
Oh god, don't get me started on the mini movies. No, 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 no. I'm, 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 I'm talking things like concepts, like spin the wheel, make a deal, where it was like randomized matches or something like that, or uh, lethal lottery, where you know you start out with like a battle royal or a tag team event or something like that, but mm-hmm. whittle it down to somebody getting a title. That's the same thing that AEW does with the specialized episodes. They're just little marketing gimmicks that make them stand out from the traditional weekly shows. It's like getting a pay-per-view without having to pay the extra money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. The and the thing about it is is like uh Mace mentioned earlier how we, you know, in our group we complain about matches that should be on pay-per-views. And it's hard to have, we argue, but it's hard to say so because they have a limited amount of pay-per-views a year. So there's gonna be a chance you'll get something special on TV. There's a chance you'll get a special event like Bash at the Beach or New Year something. I have a couple of them. Uh, I'm, I'm, winter is coming. Winter is coming. Winter is coming. Yeah. I.e. the mon- I.e. the mantra of anybody who lives where I come from. <laughs> oh, man. I, yeah, I feel but... like I, I feel like I should tell you about like uh, I'm you know I have some uh, I have some I have some stay in Canada family in Canada so coldness is whatever we're gonna die anyway. Miles will, miles will, you know. <laughs> But anyway, uh, but no, it's just like exactly like so they create as pointed out they create these TV special events which are just like as Mace pointed out special um uh, you know special like pay per view events and it's really good for the consumer because oh man then if I can't pay well you may not and I hate to say two hundred bucks a year could be expensive for some people but hey mm-hmm. saw that uh saw that fight for the fallen you saw that you know that winter is coming you got a good experience you know. Yeah, you know, yeah. It it gives it it gives the sense that you never it gives the sense of unpredictability. Actually, and, and even though they kind of announce these of these special shows coming, it means you never know when how uh, if you're if each week's going to be just a normal week or if you're going to have something special coming up. So you you get something to look forward to all the time without feeling like you have to go above and beyond to see all the good stuff. But at the same time, it never detracts from the pay per views because. While those special shows can certainly be good, they still make it sure that the pay-per-views are so epic that they're still must-see uh, wrestling. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I think it's time to talk about when I finally bu- yeah, let's, uh, uh, took let's, the dive. Let's go. Let's go into that, especially since um, All Out 2021 was the um, was the tipping point. Yes. Now, the obvious reason why where uh, why I finally took the plunge was, of course, the arrival, uh, the return after seven years of not even being like even really being involved in wrestling, aside from a brief stint on Fox, the grand return of CM Punk. Now, obviously, that was going to be a big deal no matter what, but I took a look at it because I wanted to see how that was going to end up, and right away, I think what really caught my attention was not so much that Punk was back, but the feeling he was giving off when he stepped onto that stage. When you hear his when you hear cult of personality start to play, crowd's already like lit. Like it's a sold out crowd and that crowd explodes. It literally drowned out the music they were so loud. Like I have not heard a crowd reaction like that in I think the last time I heard a crack reaction that loud was when Triple H came back from his quadricep surgery. That was how loud that crowd was. In fact, I'd say it beat that crowd with how loud AEW was that night. And you could see on Punk's face a look of pure elation to be there and to witness that. Mm-hmm. And I, as someone who watched Punk throughout his entire WWE career... I never saw him look that happy, ever, in WWE. So to see him like that immediately was like, okay, this is something special going on. I'm glad I caught this. Mm -hmm. Then comes that pay per view itself, and I think I I don't think I can I don't think I am exaggerating much when I say that All Out 2021 Matt pay per view of the year contender likely gonna win. It was probably one of the best cards they had ever had. And that's saying a lot considering the stuff. Now, 
to give you an idea of where I came from, I have dabbled. I had uh, tip, dipped my toes in at one point. I watched uh, Revolution 2021, which means I also bear witness to that uh, horribly botched ending to the main event, the exploding barbed wire death match. Fireworks match, please get it all right. And uh, not, 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 not to cut you off, Shades, I just want to remind you that CM Punk coming in was happy. It was a much different evolution from the heel CM Punk we all know when he was fighting the crowd. Back in the <laughs> CM Punk argue was punching people in the crowd. CM Punk now is hugging the crowd. What a fake. Seven years he learned not to punch us in the face. I'm happy for that. I don't know what to I'm sick and tired of these damn wrestlers coming to my head and beat me up like, you, wait, I thought you're babies. Why are you robbing me? Help me. Help me. I'm just a fan. <laughs> I'm tired of that. I'm just tired of that. So thank you, CM Punk. Thank you for stop the violence on us. Oh, and those ice cream bars. Thanks, you know. I didn't Hell get yeah. one, but thanks. <laughs> yeah, the ice cream. That was a nice little uh, cherry on top of the Sunday for the crowd in Chicago that night. Mm. Free ice cream. <laughs> Which, um... I think it's um it f is is also a nut is you know how I you know how I mentioned that whole uh, that whole awareness of outside continuity which is so, which is something <laughs> that um that Junior Land is not, is not key, is not keen on bringing up or or will only bring up rarely or in or in extremely vague terms. Yeah, um, that that is a full on acknowledgement because of because of course there was that whole thing where he was. Where he was pushing for the revival of the WWE ice cream bars. Um, that, that was that was a nice pot shot at WWE at, at Junior Land right there. <laughs> yeah, and the what I do what I do find extremely telling, and I'm 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 pretty sure I'm pretty sure a good chunk of you are aware of this particular story, is that what finally convinced him to to um to sign for AEW. Was how they handled the the death of Huber, um, the late Brody Lee. Yeah. Because because um it was pretty because there there wasn't some there wasn't some man, there wasn't some mandates on the matter. It was more of the entire locker room opted not to talk not to talk about the um, health issues that he was going through. Yeah, it was a they they instead put on a celebration of life mm -hmm. for for Huber, and the and even bringing in the former Eric Rowan at the end for a nice little touch, you know, to just really show how much love that they had for him was really something special. So it, it, it was one of those cases where they they knew how to handle a situation like this. Now, granted, WWE did do, acknowledge the, the things as well, but not to the level that AEW did because of how close everyone was with him. I and mean, he had just become the leader of the Dark Order. They had really he'd been really getting getting the big push. He was going to be a top star. Like he was going to be an event before too long. And but unfortunately, he never got that chance. And but they didn't they didn't let that stop them from acknowledging how good of a man he was and to hear the stories to see the love that he got yeah I don't blame Punk for seeing them going wow they actually give a shit about their about the wrestlers mm -hmm. maybe this is in such a bad place <laughs> to be fair the acknowledgement they gave to John Huber Mr Brody Lee Luke Harper was. In the WWE, and I'm not even trying to be an ass about it, they, they had to, people had to sneak in the appreciation to him and then they had to acknowledge it. It's, it's, I never understood this, this, this weird thing. Like every other wrestling promotion acknowledges wrestling from the past and future and acknowledge their accomplishments. I, I, um, you know, as I mentioned, I watch a lot of Japanese wrestling. I'm a Japan wrestler. I love New Japan. They, even though Shinsuke is no longer there, they still recognize the greatest intercontinental champion. They still recognize Kenny Omega as a champion. They still talk about their accomplishments they did for the company and, and their stats and everything. Shout out to Kevin Kelly, great announcer. But it's like, WWE, you're out of there. You never existed. Like, what the f is up with that? That's just a weird thing. Like, everyone else but you does it. That's just freaking weird, you know? I'm being serious. Just no, no, weird. you're, dude. You're not wrong. You're absolutely not wrong. Mm -hmm. it, it is ridiculous. I mean, there are cases where it makes sense. All right, Chris Benoit. I can understand why you don't oh, ever yeah, 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 yeah. his name again. That's different. But other wrestlers, you know, even if they had struggles, even if they had a heart, even if things were rough for them after they left, you can't deny. You can't turn around and say that they didn't happen because fans don't forget. They never mm -hmm. forget. 
There are some people out there who have, like, whole archives of everything they've done, every match they've had, even the ones that, that weren't on TV. They have some record of it. You can't deny the fans that. To do so is just moronic, and yet the Junior Land does it every fucking time. Well, well that that's pretty much it. It's Take a look at the difference between what AEW did for the family, let alone what, you know, you, you had... Uh, you know, Negative One now has a contract and, and kept his father's belt. Tony Khan is basically still funneling money to the family so that they can live and survive after after his death. And that's... What does WWE do? Anytime that any wrestler passes on, they put up a black graphic with their name and when they were born and died, and that's it. Yeah, it's... it's you know, that's, a- it is such a difference... When, oh, when, okay, yeah, Tony Khan pretty much is just spending his father's money, and his father's got a lot of money. But, but, but there's the sentimentality of turning around and saying, "Hey, this guy died. He was a big part of our company. I want to find a way to help support your family, even if it is for four or five years or something, to give you enough money that it keeps you on your feet, so you don't have to worry about anything." Yeah. yeah. The, the messed up part about it too. Not this is this actual ma- this is truth pessimism right here. I'm gonna be right here. When certain wrestlers die in Junior Land, they'll put a black image. Then maybe five or six years later, maybe a Hall of Fame, or then at the same time, they'll sell a T-shirt with that person's name on it. And that gets me really disgustingly like, upset because I've uh, I've heard stories like about the um, Pompeo family, the Savage Boys, that. His the brother Larry doesn't get a huge check because they're using his brother's image on T-shirts and things like that anymore. Oh my god, it's with this. So yeah, you, you want to know the quint? You know, I'll, I'll make this very easy. You want to know the prime example of how AEW's treatment of wrestlers has won people over? The widow of Owen Hart. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, and I I do remember. Um, I do now. I'm, I'm pretty sh- now. Um. If they if they if they've been able to win over Martha, that's so shit. Oh, that yeah, is a miracle. Yeah, Martha's a very contentious woman. I'm not. Yeah. Uh, they and yet they and yet she has endorsed an upcoming event in Owen's name in yeah. AEW. Which so yeah, they won her over. Which all things can all things considered, um, that per- that particular that particular oh, I get the feeling that particular Owen Cup is not going to be a one and done. You're going to be seeing that as a annual thing oh, yeah. that they're going to be doing for yeah. years. Um, yeah, yeah. As, as opposed to the Dusty Invitational, which, you know, I feel is. like as much, as much as Dusty absolutely loved the tag team division in NXT, uh, uh, every time I see them pull out the Dusty Dusty Rose Classic name, I'm like, no, you're, you're a company who battled for a couple of years you put for him in Cody... Co- co- for, no, for, for Cody Rhodes wasn't even allowed to use his own name yep. after he left the company. Yep. Uh, hell, yeah. Why would WWE be put, trying to honor tag teams anyway? It's very clear they hate tag teams. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> they hate tag teams. They love the ratings. That's why it matters. That's what. Oh, the Dusty's yeah. Invitational is back. The but, ratings. They must need some ratings this week. But the, the steer the ship back towards what we were originally going for, which was going to the uh, the most recent pay per view, mm-hmm. All Out twenty twenty one. I've just gone back and I've I've had a look at the card for all, for that night for for the closest pay per view at the time, which would have been SummerSlam, which was only like a, a couple of weeks earlier. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking at the card for SummerSlam, and I'm seeing Big E versus Baron Corbin. Okay, seen that not plenty of times on SmackDown. We see RK Bro, which oh my god, what a dumb idea! Uh, going up against going, going up against the now extremely wasted AJ Styles, and thank God the guy's only doing this for a paycheck before he retires. Um, his um, name is his name is actually Paycheck Styles because paycheck so styles, many, that's right. paycheck styles, because he he has so many ways of cashing that money, he doesn't care anymore. He's like, that, oh that, man, that's, heard, a, yeah. that, that, that's a guy who's just in it for the paycheck, and you can tell. Nothing uh, you know, you, you got Alexa Bliss versus Eva Marie. Who the hell would even want to watch that on free television? <laughs> I mean, yeah, Alexa Bliss is fine and all that, but Eva Marie, nobody gives mm-hmm. a fuck. No. Wait, did, 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 she, did, did she knock someone's nose? Did she, like, punch someone in the face? Oh, God, I got to talk to Josh. Josh may know. 
you had Damian Priest versus Sheamus, which I think they did a replay on Raw the next night anyway, so it was a point of putting it on pay-per-view. Then you had the Usos versus the Mysterios, which is like, okay, well, yeah, and... Cool, cool program. Yeah, Becky Lynch versus... Well, then again, this wasn't really... It was Becky Lynch versus Bianca Belair after, you know... Sasha Banks had to be taken out of the match and Becky Lynch came back and won in 10 seconds for no reason whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, Drew, Mac- Drew-, Drew McIntyre versus Jinder Mer- oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The nightmare's yeah. coming back, baby. You can vomit it. Just let, let, no, let, let it so, sorry. sorry I, could, I couldn't even stay awake even pronouncing the match. <laughs> yeah. then, we, then, we, then we had, you know, yet another Charlotte Flair wins a belt disaster over, over Nikki... Formerly cross and why the hell she wants to be a superhero, and Rhea yeah. Ripley who Sorry, deserves almost, so much better. Almost a superhero, you we, we forgot. Yeah, yeah almost. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's Hurricane Helms all over. Oh, yeah. Hurricane Helms and, and, all over again. Well, and, you, and, your, and your and th- your and your three main events for the evening was Edge and Seth Rollins, which we've seen so many times that I just went meh. Bobby Lashley versus Oldberg. You know how we, you know how we talked about that whole, that whole nostalgia obsession. There's one thing we have to bring yeah. up with, um, with the whole Edge and Seth Rollins thing, and that hit, and that being him, um, do, doing, doing a bunch of callbacks to his days in the Brood. <laughs> Something yeah. that actually, oh, oh, we, we got to bring up this story because doing that actually fucked over Gangrel. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, true story for those who haven't heard this. Yeah. Apparently, Gangrel was in talks with AEW to do a cameo in the near future until Edge pulled that shit, and AEW's like, um, we can't do that anymore, sorry. I mean, Gangrel still got paid, but he got he missed a chance for good exposure, and what's worse is Edge called him up afterwards. He was so ecstatic. He's like, hey, I, I, I did this, I'm doing this thing for the brood. I did this thing for the brood. I, I'm hoping that'll help you get more exposure. Dude, you just fucked me over. Oh, fuck, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> God damn it. I'm in but, trouble. But, like, yeah, yeah, you're in trouble. But, but, you had to, but you had your main event for the evening, which was uh, Roman Reigns versus John Cena. <laughs> with, 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 with the, with, I, I believe this was the return of Brock. I was homeless for eight months. Lesnar. Oh my god, yeah, I saw that. Oh, there was something no. very wrong about Brock Lesnar with long hair. And, I'm yeah. 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 and, 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 that, and that homeless beard? That, that, oh my god. Yeah, but, that, but, no, but, no, but, no, okay, uh, out of that entire list, not, I'd say at least 90% of it, I have see, seen or heard of it being on Raw, or has been done on pay-per-views in the past year. Yeah. And then you look at you look at, for contrast, All Out 2021, they go with Best Friends versus Jurassic... Uh, Best Friends and Jurassic Express up against the Hardy Family Office and the Hybrid 2 in a spectacular opening 10-man match. Mm-hmm. Then you had Miro and Eddie Kingston. Brilliant match. Your balls have been redeemed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was great. I was, yeah, I can't. Moxie versus Kojima. Just the, the, the surprise appearance yeah, of freaking yeah, Minoru Suzuki. Yeah, Great. Suzuki Suzuki popping up at the end going, I'm going to murder you like the grandpa I am. Yeah. <laughs> Before the Suzuki incident. And, 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 oh, God. and, as, and as, I'm, as much as I know uh, the crow doesn't like her, Baker versus Statlander was actually a decent match. It was better than zero, I'll give it that. True. <laughs> Then, then you had Lucha Brothers versus Young Bucks in that goddamn six star classic of a cage match. Match of the night, easily. Mm-hmm. That yeah. was oh my god, yeah. Ruby Soho's debut in the Casino Battle Royal. Jericho against MJF, which sure it might have been. This was like the rubber match between the the two of them. But again, these guys have put on classic after classic after classic. And I actually want to take a minute to uh, to stop you there to talk about that match because of a particular moment that really shows a contrast between the, uh, Junior Land and AEW is the ending with the referees. Where, the dusty finish. Yeah, the yeah. dusty finish that got reversed. Because if that were in Junior Land, that's the, the second half of that ending wouldn't have happened. Where it would have just been uh, 
the referee just not seeing the count, and it would have just ended there, and Jericho would have been fucked. And, the, and they would have put it put it as an angle the next night on Raw. Exactly. And Where instead it, and here it controversial. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Whereas here they didn't they didn't bullshit you with that. They went in right and like head referee comes in. Uh, no, you need to reverse this. This got you. You didn't miss this. You missed this. Oh, I did. Well, shit. Restart the match. <laughs> mm. Well, you know? God, no. Yeah. The... <laughs> And, and then, they, they, it, the crowd, they, it, they sold that to the crowd. The crowd were disappointed. They were mad. And then they saw that happen and they lost their shit. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. And and then, you know, moving on with the, the card, you had Punk and, and Darby Allen in an absolute brilliant match, considering it was technically the first time we had seen Punk wrestle in seven years against a, a young kid like Darby Allen who can go full throttle for. 20, 30 minutes at a time. And, the fact and that CM those... Punk did not lose a step. Yep, it just showed how good it was. Sure, and then, you know, we had the absolute clusterfuck of the night, which which was uh, Paul White versus QT Marshall. But, you know, you that gotta was, have... That, a, was, a cool, that you, was a cool off. It was, that was yeah. a cool off. It, they, you, they you, do... you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta have your cool off. You gotta have your, have your dead match somewhere in a car. Not yeah, everything yeah. can you be You gotta have a piss break in there somewhere. <laughs> I mean, after with how like, you look at the card up until that point, every match was so intense, so insane mm-hmm. that if you didn't have that, they would have been burned out. Considering what was coming up afterwards, yeah, they kind of needed you guys yeah. to get hyped back up again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then, then your main event was Omega and Cage, which in itself was a very good match, showing once again Christian Cage when he is not in the WWE, he puts on some damn good matches. Yeah, WWE slept on Christian when he Something could shocking. have easily been a top star mm-hmm. because he was at Edge. Yeah, he, he right. didn't have I, the same level of same kind of look that Edge has, and they passed up on such a great talent. And considering that Christian Cage is way past his prime, and he's still able to pull on matches like this, that tells you how much we could have had, honestly had if WWE actually had pushed him. What I yeah. what you're seeing what you're seeing in him now is what is what I was seeing for the longest time during during that um during that brief bit of years when he was just in, when he in was impact in, when he was in impact um yep yeah down to down to the point that they that they got his um they got his old they got his old impact theme as well yeah, yeah. Which, which is which is all well and good and the fact that. And then, then you obviously had the surprises of the night of Adam Cole walking out there going, hey, the ink is still drying on my contract, Tony. <laughs> yeah, and, follow, it, and, then follow, and then follow that up with the American Dragon. I believe my words were... Not Daniel Bryan, Mr. Yes, Yes, Yes. No, this is... I. This is the American dragon. I'm going to kick your teeth down you th- down your throat, so you're going to be munching your own shit for a year, Brian Danielson. <laughs> yeah, they're, oh god, one of the best shooters in the business. I mean, yeah, God, it was so good to see him smiling with his signature white T-shirt you can all buy from Hanes. You know, money <laughs> classic right there, helping the industry. Oh, uh, but but when you have a look at the t- the two cards back to back, you could see a major difference. The, all these matches that we had. Like with the exception of probably Jericho versus MJF, these were all first time matches or matches that haven't been done to death on television. And then they set up some of the biggest surprises for the year just to make it really feel like an epic event. And from that point on, AEW has has had has had this formula that we're starting to realize that I'm starting to see the patterns now on Dynamite and Rampage, where they're going to, going to give you a world-class four- to five-star match as an opener on their television shows. Which I think is actually really smart. You know, mm. it, it, Honestly, it, it has been proven that the best thing you can do for something like this is give to the people what they want immediately, because then they're going to want to stick around like, oh, if you're giving us that now, what else have you got? Right, and the best part, oh, the best part about it is I, I think uh, Mace have noticed or people have noticed is that their matches when they start are commercial free. There's no commercials in the first match of every night, and yeah. I think that's the best way to do it because again, you're you're you got a very you got a small amount of window well, to convince people to watch your show to get in there. The mm-hmm. best way to describe it is I'm going to make a small tangent here. Does everybody here watch a YouTube video now? Right, we watch YouTube, right? Mm-hmm. 
Right. Have you mm-hmm. noticed on YouTube that people's videos now put a little trailers of coming up? They show like their best highlights of the of the of the video, and then the video starts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, here's what you get to look forward to. Exactly. So by putting that as your first opening, a little teaser to your product or to mixing, you have a very few seconds. You got the guys. To, you got the gut butts in the seat. That's how you do it. You have to get it tantalizing. You have to think every show there's someone new coming to watch, and it seems to be yeah. working for AEW because they're hitting a million viewers a week. Yeah. <laughs> hitting it. I'll s- also, another good. And, and I, will, I, will, I will, I will say with the the whole uh, commercial thing, it's not ad free. It's picture in picture. They are working that spectacularly. The only reason why we're saying commercials three, free is because a lot of us have been watching on fight, and when you watch on fight, you don't go to picture in picture. They just stay with the action. Yeah. When exactly. I was watching, when I was, no, when I was watching on Normie TV, the first match is um before I switch to fight TV with the good, the good, you smart people. Uh, it is, it is free. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that yeah, yeah. The oh. first match is commercial free. The rest of them, but another yeah. comparison I think we need to make is also something that you know you don't think about when, you, especially when you're like us and we're watching on our own, we're watching as a group, we're talking with each other. The commentary teams. I mean, it's, which uh, which we have um, Tony Schiavone who decided to take a break from from being a barista for for a while because who ordered the latte? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, good old Jr. Jim Ross who. Does stumble on does stumble on occasion, but he's well aware of his stumbling, and he's he's earned the right to stumble a few times. And yeah. um, a man who I who I'm pre, who some of us had known for years, but has finally get, finally got his real proper break. Um, shut up, Excalibur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh. Excalibur. It, it, like I already knew the the fact that we have. JR and Shivani working together is mind blowing for an old school wrestling fan like myself. But then I then I sit here and I listen to Excalibur do commentary and my God, he I can see why he gets to work alongside those two legends because my God he he goes he's right there with them. Mm-hmm. He is freaking running that show and you you compare that to the commentary team. He, he, remi- he reminds me he reminds me of Mike Tanay in WCW. That's like oh, that God, knowledge. He That's kind of that the knowledge that he's that he's been put in. And mm. the thing is, for the longest time, I hated um, I hated three man commentary teams because I felt that they <laughs> because I felt that they um, made too that they that there's too much noise and and it and you end up with three guys just talking instead instead of calling it. Like it's like it's perfectly fine to have and it's even worse when you have the, when you have those three and you have somebody doing guest commentary. It gets it gets absolutely ridiculous, but. Then I, then I looked back at when WCW did it and went and when other promotions have done it, and I realized that the problem that I had is that the issue isn't with three man commentary; it's with um, it's with people not having distinct roles. Like if you look at a, if you look at a two man commentary booth, you have one person doing play by play and one person doing color, and typic and yeah, you can have one person being the face and one person being the heel, but typically they're act they're um, presenting different energies. For lack of a better term, yeah. And the, what made what makes a good three man team is that you have those, and then you have an analyst. Mm-hmm. That yeah. was what that was what uh, WCW actually did right. Because mm-hmm. uh, you had Tony, you Tony, have... Tony Schiavone doing play by play. You had either Zabisco or Heenan doing the color commentary, and you had Mike Tanay doing the history and the technicals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. the, ana- the an- analysis like that—that that kind of team works, and you're kind of seeing that a little bit here in AEW. Excalibur's doing the play-by-play; he, like that is his big thing. You've got, I, I, you know, Tony Schiavone is kind of becoming more of the color guy these days, uh, in a sense, and b- mainly playing off of a certain certain aspects of his WCW days. And then you've got Jr., who's kind of becoming the the history and analysis guy. Mm. And they really make that work together. And then occasionally you get the guest commentator who is just there to kind of talk shit. And then you get things like, you know, Excalibur and Taz and Tony that are just like so off the rails that it's hilarious. Yeah, that's because, yeah, although I got I to gotta call out Taz because I, I, I love the guy, but my God, he, even in commentary, he's past his prime because mm-hmm. oh, he's yeah. talking about JR stumbling. <laughs> Taz mm-hmm. is First all ball. over himself. Taz is there for the memes. If you've not seen Boshman, it's snippet Taz comedy we're paying for. 
Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, that's that's, the, that's what we get out of that. It is so but, meme worthy. But I, yeah. I think a, a big difference again, going to the difference between the commentary teams in in Junior Land and in AD, AEW, is that you can tell the guys in Junior Land they've got Vince or somebody in their ear the entire time screaming, "Tell a story! We gotta get this promoter! We gotta do this next!" Gotta, rah, rah. Whereas yeah. A, whereas a, AEW, essentially, I think for 99% of it is, okay, we're going to this match, guys, so make sure you're doing what you got to do and just let them go. And then when it's like, okay, you guys are going to be on camera in three, two, one, vamp. And they do it. Yeah, because they, cause they, they let know. Them do their jobs. Yeah, well, with, especially with JR. You don't tell JR how to do his damn job. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't even think I don't even think Junior could ever tell him. Oh, no, Ju- Junior problem. Junior has tried many times to get Jr. to do his job, and Jr. just tells him to shut the fuck up. Exactly. Yeah, been, yeah. Jr. knows what the fuck he's doing. But yeah. yeah, but that's my point. Is like, yeah, you you listen to Junior Land commentary, and it's so homogenized, so pasteurized, sterilized. Because of the fact that yeah, Vince is basic. You might as well just have Vince out there doing the commentary by himself because that's literally all it's all it is. I mean, Which is scary because he he actually used to be a good commentator back in the day. I sadly yeah. yes. Look looking back ba- looking back, I do th- I do think he did make a he did make a, d- a good pairing with him and Ventura. And yes, I, <laughs> once again once again, um, minute once again hometown bias. <laughs> I can't escape it. You know, I swear to God, if you have a photo of Rick Rude right behind us, I swear to God. Anyway, <laughs> look. But, the, 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 other, the other thing I will I will say, like WWE commentary over the years has become less about what's in the ring, more about promoting what what's your main event, what's coming up next, what's the reason why you should tune in for the next half an hour. Uh, what's the next big pay per view? What's your main event that night? What wrestlers are appearing on what shows? Uh, promoting other TV shows, promoting the sponsors. By the time yeah. they get through all that, they aren't paying any attention to the match whatsoever for ninety nine percent of the time. Yeah. AEW is one hundred percent on the match. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and well, and, uh, occasionally AEW does occasionally do a little promotional, but but it's so few and far between that it's not it doesn't interfere with anything. But I think all of this finally leads me to this one of the big central points that I want to make as far as comparing WWE to AEW and why a lot of fans are are just so sick of WWE's bullshit and are ready to become all elite because it's the same reason now. Now, I think Monk and I are going to agree with this. If you're going to jump ship, do it because you just want to see something good, not because you want to stick it to the WWE. Yeah. Fuck that noise. You will fail. But it, it, Back up, back up. You have no idea how powerful being petty is. You have no idea what you're talking about here. Oh, oh no, we know very well how powerful being petty is. Do you That's have any idea who you're talking to? <laughs> no idea, but it doesn't matter. You, I'll, I'll give you guys a short story about my life. There was a girl in high school who made fun of me and broke my glasses in one of my comic books. I'm really successful now. I paid a car to drive up, smash mud in her face, and called her a horrible thing, and drove by like thing happened. I waited 10 years to do that. That is, pa- that is petty. <laughs> I can tell you one better. And- <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. I can tell you one better. I will, I will say this straight out, going back to my training days in, in wrestling. I still hold a grudge with Tanil. Because the bitch dropped me on my head during training and almost cost me my my career. Neil Dashwood? Yes. Holy shit, dude. G- giving me a hip toss. She let her knee buckle out on a hip toss and it dropped me on my head. Fuck when, she, when, when she got signed to the WWE to her, were good luck in your future endeavors, bitch. <laughs> Oh, anyway, anyway to, getting back to my point, though, with everything we've talked about tonight, one of the big central points I want to make is that there is a very, very key difference between these two organizations and why fan, and fans are noticing this. And this is why they're making the jump, because WWE has matches to promote storylines, whereas AEW has storylines to promote matches. And it it you don't think about it, but that is such a very key difference that it just it makes all the difference. 
and I think I think the re when it comes to, when it I think the other um I think the other the other thing that I've noticed with a lot of people who are, who have um who have made the who have made the jump in one form or another is the is the fact that they don't they don't have to talk themselves into enjoying it. Like if you if you listen if you listen to the way a lot a lot of people talk when it comes to covering a modern a modern pay per view even a even a better pay per view from the last I don't know five years, um, you end up having to talk yourself through the bad parts in order to get to the good parts. The whole thing of uh, yes yes yes. Uh, okay, not to cut you off, brother. This is the the what you're describing to me is one of the reasons why I have a deep hatred or a deep dislike. Of WWE fan media, like the the mental gymnastics they have to do to convince themselves they're watching something good or things get better or the thing the way there is, but just give me Stockholm syndrome. Like, dude, you are aware you're watching garbage. Just stop. It's gonna be okay. Just stop watching it, please. Do it for me, Cody. For me. <laughs> Go out to your wife. Do it. Get for a you. clock. Oh, sorry. I'm going for a do it for the Rock. <laughs> Do it for the rock, yeah. No, no, no. You don't. You don't do it for the rock. You do it for the Glock. And you do it for the Glock, yeah. You, you, know? you blow your TV brains on the floor. You buy a plasma screen and watch some Japanese and AEW wrestling. Oh wait, we, we can, can we kill TVs on this podcast? That's fine, right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Um, Richard Pry Richard Pryor killed a car once. <laughs> Damn straight he did. Yeah, because I'm just saying it's like since between you and me. If I go out there, I buy a gun, and I blow a TV head up, I see a horrible Baron Court match where you do is like, oh no, maybe there's a match better later on. Screw that noise. I have better wrestling to watch. <laughs> also, All right, cut um, the promo. Just, just, but, getting, just, but, getting, but, but, just getting my but, gun nerd out of my system. Glocks are overrated. Not when they're held by Arn Anderson. Not by Glock Anderson. His real name is Glock Anderson. Arn is a slave name. But I... I, I will say this, and again, from a wrestling point of view, as somebody who's been in the ring and been in production and everything else, and it's also the stories that have been coming out with all of these guys that have jumped ship to AEW, they all say the same thing. They watch AEW backstage at an NXT show or a WWE show because they can't deny that, yes, they actually watch this stuff at the shows. As well, much as Vince well, doesn't you, like to admit it. Well, you got these long stretches where you got fuck all to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they're, they're watching the competition going, they're seeing guys that are going out there and they're passionate. They're happy. You can tell that they want to be there. They're not there because they're contractually obligated. These guys could be working on a pay per appearance contract and they'll happily rock up again the next night going, hey, you got a spot for me on the card. Whereas WWE. You are, the guys of there are feeling so restricted, so watched, so overmanaged, micromanagement, whatever you want to call it, that they're feeling a, a gigantic weight of pressure on their shoulders that when they, when their contracts are coming up, instead of going, oh, should I re-sign or do I have to go back to, you know, 50 bucks and a hot dog at the Indies? All of a sudden, there's this another light that's coming in and it's Tony Khan with an a AEW contract. And they're going, I can be there and be happy. And I can, I, can, I can join all these guys who want to be there, who are happy to be there, that radiate this energy that makes me want to be a part of what they're showing instead of, oh, crap, i got to be out in the ring for a multicolored NXT show in 10 minutes. Word. Oh, God. You know, every, every punk, punk has said it. Ruby Riot was saying it. Jericho has said it. Uh, even there was a after this past week because they're out in Philadelphia. Tony Khan, when the cameras were off, came out and did a little celebration for the ECW originals, and he brought out Dean Malenko and and Jerry Lynn. Jericho was there, and and Taz, and I think it was either Jericho or Jerry who said, "You know, I was at the other company, and I was watching AEW." And all of a sudden, I wanted to be there. You know, uh, even even Adam Cole has said it. I was watching the, the days tick down on my NXT contract because I wanted to be over there. Sure, I want to be over there with my wife, but I want to be over there because I could see the fun the guys were having. I could see the, the expressions on their faces. They wanted to be there. And I think that when you have 
happy wrestlers who want to be a part of it, who want to put in the time, effort, and everything else because they want to do it, mm. as opposed to, I am contracted to do this because Vince now says that I have to put on a stupid headdress and call myself, you know, Branson McGillicuddy or Stevie McFrost or whatever because he controls everything. Whereas I can take my name and go over to this other company, this AEW company, and they just turn around and go, can you put on good matches? Yep. Cool. We've got a spot for you. Walk right on in. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, that, and that comes through to, to the audience, and that what brings the audience to the product. Um, when it comes to... One thing, that, one thing that I think is I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up regarding, regarding Adam Cole is, two, is twofold. One, um, it was a surprise to him as well when his contract was coming up. <laughs> Even though, even though he had extended it so that he could finish out his program with um, Kyle O'Reilly, but apparently, if the if the story is any indication, for one, there's the fact that they um they wanted him to change his name because we can't have more than one Cole, and make um cut his hair and make him a ma- make him Keith Lee's manager. Yeah, which, yeah. Is, which is um pants on head retarded. <laughs> <laughs> And Take one of, your, one of your biggest NXT wrestlers and you turn oh. him into a manager. Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's just, but it's too real. But there is also the fact that there is also the other story, and this is this is where I really want to hammer home. Um, one of the sticking points for him that w- that was effectively a deal breaker was they was they wanted him to drop his um, Twitch channel, the Chugs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, I've I've I'd I'd seen a few people say what what's the big deal? It's just it's just a it's just a it's just a channel where he where he's just where people are just watching him play video games. But he had he had talked, but the way he had talked about it, it's a it's a place that that channel meant a lot meant a lot more to him than people think because he described he described it as he would he had done a lot more he had done a lot of shows uh, shows on that when um. When the lockdowns really, really kicked in, because, well, what else? What else have you got to? What else have you got to do besides besides work out? Um, and he's and he had ended up building up a bit of a community through that, and would get messages about how, um, watching watching um sessions with the Chugs, had um, had helped had helped people through tough places or. Had provide had provided a brief escape from the, from their own stresses, and he couldn't bring him he couldn't bring himself to just cut all that off. It it would the he didn't outright say it, but the vibe that he, the vibe that he gave is that it felt like it would be a betrayal if he did that. Yeah, uh, if I can get back to it, it's just that like the WWE at least Vince's like the company the the Met is like hey uh, you work for us we own you you have no way out in a profit. And when you throw you out, discard it. The crappy part about it is, like, did this hurt them in any way? It wasn't, like, a perfect example of this is, I'm going to do a slight tangent. Does anyone in here are aware of VTubers? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, okay. Dude, I am one. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, you're not my wife, boob. I'm straight. Anyway. Um, <laughs> all right, so back to it. So are you aware of the former VTuber Hall Live, uh, Kirio Coco? <laughs> See, I'm being very, 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 very polite as I can before oh, I start screaming. Oh wait! Oh wait! You're serious. Let me laugh you even deadly, harder. <laughs> deadly serious. The reason why I'm deadly serious no, 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 is because no, no, I'm trying no. to tell a very nice story about I, going I in alcoholic mode, right? That's not why I'm laughing. I'm laughing because, for, because that, because that, because Coco is the reason why he even got into VTubing. Yeah, I, okay. I think I'm gonna have to send you something before I uh before before the night's I'll, done. I'll, all right, I'll I'll, 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 I'll I'll remember to like dox you later. But anyway, Coco <laughs> is I was from a Hollywood shooter graduate, right? Big stuff, emotional, love her, she's best girl, right? So waiting for that tracksuit to come in, I ordered, but whatever, right? So she before that, you probably noticed, was a streamer on her own called Kason. That account still active, she was still doing so. Mm-hmm. So. Even if people who were fans of her when she was Kason or Coco still fought their channel are okay with it, 
Hollow Live didn't really care that much about it that much as what she did, and that's okay. The only reason why you want to limit someone's personality from it is that a sense of, like, effing control. Like, what do you gain from Adam Cole having a Twitch channel? Oh no, he's ruining kayfabe! You already killed kayfabe, Vince! You killed God! God's dead now! We live in an atheist society with degenerates running around eating chicken wings with their bare hands! It's over! <laughs> but, over, Vince! But, yeah, you the, won! The, cra the crackdown on, on, um, on Twitch and Cameo um, was... Very much, very much felt like, very much felt like a power play kind of move, especially since, especially since um, the idea, the fun, the funny thing is that it seemed like it seemed like the bone that they were gonna throw was a was an official, I guess, an official, I guess, esports presentation with 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 various stars. Except that's not the reason why people would watch, say, Superstar Spotlight on Up Up Down Down. It was. Yeah. It was. It was to see. It was to see people relaxing with vi relaxing with video games and te and telling du and telling dumb stories. Um, yeah. Where the and more often than more often than not, they were they were presenting a side of themselves that they did that they didn't otherwise. It's why they um, why they had a completely different name, like Kofi Kingston going under Mister Twenty Four Seven and being being um that guy that we always had to deal with in any competitive game. <laughs> you, don't, you know, yeah. you know who he is because he never shuts up. He is, he was the video game equivalent of Jack Evans. I yeah, like Jack exactly. Evans, but I don't like people who talk more than me. <laughs> but, From the that, but again, that's that's one of, again a major difference between AEW and Junior Land is that if you want to go out and do something like you want to go out there, make yourself a partner on Twitch or whatever, they are going to support you. They they are saying go out, do it, have fun, you know. And if you want to do it on our official channels, then we have an official channel you can do it on. Like yeah, I'm I'm actually looking forward. I've got queued up on my uh, YouTube playlist right now. Adam Cole and Evil Uno playing Far Cry Six. I reckon that's nice, going to be man. hilarious. And cool. yeah, on the on that same and and, and, that and, if you, and if you want to, but the thing is, AEW turns around and says, if you want to make money outside of our business, that's your business that is your money we are not going to take it from you mm -hmm. junior turns around and goes well we own you we own your name we own your face we own your voice we own everything about you if you go out and even try to make dollar one without our permission then guess what you are going to see an absolute backlash on you at some point and, and the real the real sad reality of that is is that legally he should that junior should not be able to do this because he, he is doing all this while still saying that his employee, that his that the, his wrestlers are independent contractors. This is going against everything that being an independent contractor is about. This is why politicians like Andrew Yang are going, no, you can't do this. Right, and, and the strapping part about it, it's like, it's just so messed up. It's like, it's not like you're, like, all different side, regardless how you pay them, whatever, they can still do what they gotta do. It's not like, again... How does Adam Cole or any other wrestler having an outside source like Cameo or Twitch or even YouTube is harming your business? If anything, you should, as Mace pointed out, integrate it into your business. You, do you want to put your vlog on our... We have an AEW podcast. We have an AEW gaming channel. You have our own Spotify. Just, if you're interested in plugging your content there, go ahead. If not, enjoy yourself. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think... That people, the, the AEW manager is losing their coach shit every time Zami Guevara is filming people backstage or a BTE segment. No one cares. And it's, it's just it's doing them a favor. It's a yeah, win-win exactly. win for every. Because if the more people are talking, if, if these guys are doing their own thing and getting their own popularity, they can that they'll then draw people to the to AEW to say, hey, these guys are awesome streamers. Oh, they're wrestlers too. Let's see how they wrestle. Oh God, this stuff's awesome. Here's all these other guys. I want to keep watching more. Win-win. Exactly. Let's, cons just let's consider one example from being the elite. You remember when there was that run when there was that running gag when e where everybody was hazing Flip Gordon. <laughs> oh god yeah yeah they oh man oh poor the flippy flip him try, him, the whole thing of him trying to get some booking on um on all in and would was willing to do anything to get it and then you finally have the culmination of him getting booked on all on all in and people can see that he's really fucking good yep 
Well, really hell, good. Hell, yeah. hell, if it wasn't for being the elite, there would be no AEW. Exactly. Yeah. So, so they it, understand it, that that kind of thing works for them. Exactly. It's just like, you can just call cross, as I mentioned before, how going to CEO, a fighting game tournament, and into the subcultures, marketing. Using marketing like this will help people get in. There are multiple ways of getting people into the door. Multiple avenues. Just do it. It's not like they're harming the product. Unless Sammy Guevara is filming, you know, Kenny Omega taking a shower. I think that's be pretty messed up, but come on, you know. Unless something like that happens, even, like, there's nothing I feel that is hurt. Anything they're doing is going to harm the product. So, why are we have? why you have to, like, go this hard to be like, yeah, you can't have a Switch or anything, because you'll ruin the character. I'm like, what character? That, that Bianca Belair has really long hair and she tied it up like a rat tail? Or, you know, Sasha Banks' blue hair? Oh, no. There's no the black girl in the universe has blue hair. Oh, boy. Oh, my God. You own that freaking event. Anyway. <laughs> but it's just, yeah. it's just so mind numbing. Yeah. Um there's all there's also it, there's also the fact that we're in we're in a, we're in a bit of a um boom period when it comes to a lot of people um doing podcasts. Um some pe- some people some people got on that particular wave early like um like Jer- like Jericho or Col- or Colt Cabana. Um, some people are get are getting on that thing a little a little bit more recently. Um, Co- Cody has had the has has been doing a podcast called it called Anything But Wrestling, where they talk about other to- where they talk about other topics and go out of their way to not mention um, wrestling. In, in fact, only <laughs> mentioning it at the start at the start of the podcast and saying that's the last time you're gonna hear you're gonna hear that for the rest of it. Um, but be beyond beyond all beyond. Um, all of that. There was there was the fact that I'm not sure if he's still doing it, but for the longest time, Cody would go on social media and a- and ask people um, what they thought of things. Um, I'd imagine that it's a little bit harder for him to do that nowadays because he's because he's been doing all these other things. But the fact that the the fact that that olive branch was even reached out um, speaks volumes. And. Obviously, you don't want to do everything everything that your that your audience says you says you want to. Otherwise, you end up losing your identity. But that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that you can't um you can't reach out because the with a lot with a lot of lapsed with a lot of lapsed fans who are coming in, they are coming in from the mi- from from a mindset of have of having a very adversarial relationship with the with um with Junior Land. The idea, the idea, the idea that they, that in order to get anything done, they have to be complete assholes, um, in the in the crowd when it comes when it comes to the whole hijacking thing. Um, but that, but I think I think they're slowly learning that they don't have to. It's the I, I think the I think the case in point of that is CM Punk um, retiring the voice of the voiceless moniker. Yeah. So. Wait, wait, can I back up? So you're saying that they won't listen to my idea of putting putting Jericho through a table only to the person putting through a table was Toroyano? We don't want Toroyano putting Jericho through a table? Is that how is that a bad idea? <laughs> well first off you'd have to get first off you'd have to get Toroyano in you'd have to get Toroyano in, into into the state into the States, which might be difficult given recent events. But se- second off, that's not the match that I would do. Is the match that if you're gonna bring in if you're gonna bring in Toru Yano, bring him bring him bring him in against say Orange Cassidy. Of course, of course, but I want to see evil Toru Yano, not the not the comedy man, that the badass Toru Yano, and then we get comedy match. But I'm just kidding. But no, no, <laughs> no. I'm, I'm just gonna obviously it's, please, please if AEW's listening, sign Toru Yano to a three match deal with Ka- Ka- Orange Cassidy, please, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> also, I, I think. What really, where this whole adversarialness of Junior really coming from, it goes back to what I said earlier, how WWE has taken the worst aspect of of the past and integrated into the modern era. And one of those aspects being the fact that the authority is evil. Yeah, the... One uh, of the biggest fallout, Mm -hmm. yeah, the biggest fallout of the Attitude Era was how... Vince, uh, how Vincent McMahon Jr. set himself up as an evil authority figure. Granted, it was kind of unavoidable given how things turned out, but it's now, because of the fact that they kept 
pushing that with evil authority figure after evil authority figure over the decades. It has now created a mindset that anything that the top brass at WWE does is going to be met with evil intent, is going to be seen with evil intent. Thus, the fans are now Pavlovianly designed to hate it. And the the problem the, the problem with that is not to cut you off, but boy, how will you? How is that was an inevitable? Vince has always been evil. Have you not hear his history? No, I'm kidding, but <laughs> no, I, yeah, yeah. The point that is draws is heat and it draws me money. The point it draws, is, exactly, got it. If it draws me heat, it draws me money. Well, the fun the funny thing is, if you look at the if you look at the golden era, um, even even though he even though he kept getting booed, the the the, the Authority figure were were people were people like Jack Tunney, or um, or Gorilla Monsoon, in some in some ca- in some cases. There was the whole thing of I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to put up a decent product, and it's those heels who keep fucking it up. Um, you had of of, co- of course when it came to the with a lot of um with a lot of promotions. He, he, the heels did a fucking it up. Roman Reigns. Yeah, the ba- man with the wettest hair. They were they were, ba- they were baby faces, and the. And um, they and they were and and they were trying to get they were trying to they were trying to put they were trying to put all the heat on the heels who were who kept trying to get in the way of things, um, the good the the um 1.0 era of NXT you had that you had a ba- you had a babyface authority figure with um with William Regal, who um <laughs> is is a bit is a bit of a story is a bit of a story. Is we have a storyteller in and of himself. I'd love, I'd love to see him do an audiobook of his own, of his own stories or something like that. <laughs> um, He's an interesting person from what the stories I heard about him. <laughs> also, yeah. also, I, I do, lo- I do love the fact that when the cruiserweight classic came along and Tajiri came back, he, re- he resumed his character because for some reason he, he doesn't, he doesn't like Tajiri. <laughs> Probably <laughs> because Tajiri kept trolling him incessantly. Yeah. Yeah, but but here but the getting back to my point with this is that yeah, ever since that ever since the attitude era, WWE has put this mindset of the authority is evil. So whenever they whenever and unfortunately it's now bled over into reality so that when people see that oh, certain like Roman Reigns is getting a push, now that Pavlovian complex kicks in, they're seeing oh, the top brass likes Roman Reigns. That must mean he's a he that they they now he is a heel, even though he's not supposed to be. It's this oh we're supposed to boo him because he's the author he's the, apparently the what the people what the authority sees as the best guy. That's what they've done. Whereas AW, you know Tony Khan hardly ever shows up. He he hardly is ever on camera. He stays behind the scenes. But whenever and whenever he does come out, it's usually for something an awesome moment like that ECW mm-hmm. thing you mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Like he he doesn't come out to make matches, and he, when he does, it's usually for good kind of matches, like you know, just for fun matches, not for kind of storyline reasons. He stays out of that because that's not his job, and that allows the fans to look at the whole thing as, oh, it's no, you're only supposed to focus on the wrestlers and what they're doing, and decide if the, and their attitudes determine who we boo and who we cheer. It yeah. make, it makes it much easier to discern black and white in this case. Mm-hmm. There, there is no authority figure or representation of the authority or or the the people backstage, the the bookers or anything in AEW whatsoever on screen. Yeah, they are doing what they are supposed to. They're meant to be behind the scenes, and that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and to be oh. fair, it's not oh. just it's not just Junior Eric Bischoff and Vince Russo kind of help this to help this to do this thing too. They're just as much to blame for all of this. It's it's oh, one yeah. of those, it's one of those cases of um of of some of something be, of trying to trying to capture lightning and lightning in a bottle. Um, I've because of the I'm I'm prepping for a third episode of the of the Exodus trilogy, and because of that, I've been delving into the history. Of World of Warcraft, which meant I had to revisit the Blood Plague incident. Oh, you poor bastard! Um, <laughs> for those who don't know, the blood and I'm go- I'm gonna bring this I'm I'm bringing this up briefly to make to make a point, but the Blood Plague incident was the result of was the result of one little oversight causing a causing a debuff that was for an endgame raid 
to get it to get out of the instance that it was initially designed to be in. The so, the to, like I could get, it was the Temple of Haka, the final boss, the Snake God Haka mm -hmm. would cast a blood debuff that would radiate in a six uh, six yard circle, mm -hmm. and any time somebody came within that six yard it would transfer to the next player. So you, you'd have somebody who had the Corrupted Blood, which was the name of the debuff, mm -hmm. and they'd have to stand at a certain distance away from other players or else it'll spread through the group and wipe. Yeah. The, the, pro what the, problem, the problem was that Hunters had... The way the Hunters' pets were designed at the time, they were seen as an extra player in the raid. So not only did Hunters have to worry about themselves getting Corrupted Blood, but they had to worry about their pets getting Corrupted Blood. Because once their pets got it, they come back to the... Uh, if they went anywhere near any other member, they get the, get it and it's spread. The thing was that some trolley mofos realized that as a hunter, you could recall your pet with the debuff still active on the pet. So when the next time you brought it out, it still had this corrupted blood ticking uh, radius like plague thing. And... You know, trolley people being trolley people would go into overpopulated places like Iron Forge and Orgrimmar, drop their pet, and just start laughing. And the whole thing went into meltdown. And um... so bad they had to shut the servers down and do a forced update on all servers in order to cr fix the problem, so that none of the cr and they had to go through all hunter pets as and demon pets to make sure that none of this was on any of the characters before they restarted the server. Yeah. This this has been used as um, plague modeling by the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. This is how they started preparing for COVID. Now, the reason why the reason why I bring this kind of thing up is when Wrath of the Lich King came out, when they were building up for for their set for their second expansion, they tried to replicate that with a with a more undead themed spin on it but it didn't but it didn't catch because you can't do that kind of thing twice and where i where i tie where i tie this into um junior land is they made bank with the austin mcmahon feud but they but they had thought hey this this thing made us money so if we so if we try this thing again we'll we'll we'll, we'll rake in the dollars and the pro the problem is they ended up taking the wrong lessons because the reason that worked is because of of all of the people involved and and I'm inclu I'm including the environment but when you but you can but that's one of those things that that everything just um wor everything just worked in the in the right way to make to make it all, to make it all a masterpiece how wrestling else? being wrestling being hot in the nineties mm -hmm. really helped push that, and I think in part the competition between WCW and the WWF at the time was a big factor in it as well. Yeah, but the point that I'm getting at is that <coughs> is, I'm is I'm trying to replicate something that happened that level of organic was all is always going to be doomed to failure. But it's um it's the equip it's the equivalent of Einstein's definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over, and expecting different results, mm -hmm. because they keep thinking, "Well, that, well, that one didn't work, but this time, this time it'll work." And of, and of course, it never, and of course, it never does. And whereas, yeah. um, I think, I think, t aside f the 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 closest t the closest time to an in storyline appearance of Tony Khan was. Didn't didn't even sh di he didn't even show his face. He was he he was having um he was having John Moxley yelling at him about the fact that his match with Kenny Omega was going to be a lights out match and wouldn't count towards his win loss record. And that's really it. <laughs> that was re that was within the first year. Yeah. And a lo a lot of the things that they're trying now in in Junior Land is again they. Like you said, they're trying to do stuff that worked organically in the past. The only thing is, is a lot of the guys that got over in in the the heyday era, that like the Stone Colds, the Rocks, Triple H's, 
they got over naturally because they understood the wrestling business and they realized a, a, a little trick that was able to get them over. For Austin, it was the fact that he turned, he had nothing left. He had nothing. Like, he was the ringmaster. ringmaster. He was staring down the barrel of unemployment because his gimmick was going nowhere. So he turned around the vents and he said, let me design my own gimmick. And he came up with the Stone Cold Persona. He just had a hard time getting the name. And the second he hit the name, and for some reason, they got to a situation where he was the next best choice. King of the Ring... 90 was it 96 where you where he won it yeah 96. yeah 96 the reason he went over on that pay-per-view was because of triple h and Shawn michaels doing the curtain call mm. not too uh, too long earlier at madison square garden so they took it off hunter hunter was supposed to win that year and get the big push they saw the trajectory that steve was on with the stone cold character and went okay you're the next best in line Go out there, you're gonna win it. We're gonna put the we're gonna strap the rocket to you. And even Austin has admitted what he hit that night was magic and could not be replicated. Coming up with Austin 316, coming up with uh that's the bottom line. Those were things that he made up on the spot just because you know it was something that he, he wanted to do. You know, he heard about Jake cutting a promo earlier in the night about, you know, being a religious man and everything. And Austin went, you know what? Well, then Austin 316 said, I just whooped your ass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that resonated with fans. It was a magic moment. The the rock was another one when he started, when he started doing the over arrogant, he, when he embraced die, Rocky die. And just went ham on the crowd and then just went over the top with it. And then eventually the crowd embraced him. Triple H, when he first started to take off, you know, he was originally the blue blood Hunter Hearst Helmsley. It's when he went, you know what, screw it. We're going to embrace the click. Yeah. And, And you got Triple H with Shawn Michaels in DX. It hit that perfect storm moment that cannot be replicated no matter how many times you try it. Yeah, it's like why the NWO only worked in, like, 96 through 98. It was this perfect storm that worked really well and just was a shock moment. And as much as Vince keeps trying to redo it, he's had medi- he's had small success every now and again. Like, the shield was all right, but they pushed the wrong guy afterwards. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, they, start, they started... You know the breakout. The breakout guys in that group were Moxley and Rollins, and it took forever for Vince to see the value in them and strap the rocket to them. And by the time they strapped the rocket to Mock to to Ambrose, he just went, "Eh, I'm over your shit." Yeah, and, and then he did, then he went to Japan and and remade his name as John Moxley. Meanwhile, you know you've got you got Seth Rollins and Roman Reigns battling essentially each other to try and take spot top spot when everybody's is everybody's behind Rollins, but nobody's behind Roman Reigns, yet Roman Reigns is the one with the, the ten thousand rockets strapped to his ass. Now the point the point that the point that I'm getting at with the with with this with this kind of thing is um I have I've I mentioned earlier on that I can I consider nostalgia to be a sweet poison. Mm-hmm. I can that I um that I have, I've had the, I've had the attitude for a very long time, that um, trying, that trying to chase, the trying to chase nosta- trying to chase nostalgia, trying to chase some, some sort of good old days that, of uh, some sort of comfort, it is junk food. It might make you feel good in the moment, but, ev- but eventually you're gonna, g- eventually you're going to feel bloated, just in the same way as you would if you, if you were binging, just in the same way as you would if you were binging on, um. On ho hos or some shit, which is on, which is on the list of things I I wouldn't know. I can't eat I can't eat those because of all because of the fucking chocolate. <laughs> yeah, monk can't eat chocolate. Mm. Period. Diabetes. No. No allergies. Okay. Fair, Fair enough. 
Oh, and, and, and believe me, I, I can I can understand what you're saying with the nostalgia being a, a sweet poison. Believe me, as a fan of franchises such as Transformers, Masters of the Universe, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, yeah, I can understand exactly where you're going with that. Yeah, and the 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 key th- the key thing with that is we've we've mentioned the folly of of try of trying to find the next blank. And that was the reason why I brought up um, why I brought up UFC earlier. In, in in with the people who with a lot of the people who who are who have been at the who have been at the top over the last twenty years, none of them were none of them have ever been billed as the next blank. Um, mm-hmm. And in fact, in fact, a lot of them were able to, were able to get over specifically because they were different from what came before. And you look at the you you look at the people who are at. The, as much as as much as we, as much as people have made comparisons to um, MJF and Ric Flair, no, there is no there is no attempt to try and bill him as the next Ric Flair. People are just seeing comparisons because of the amount of heat that he has. When it comes to Ken, when it comes to um Ken, when it comes to Kenny Omega, um nobody's trying to nobody's trying to bill him as the as the as any sort of next. Um, mm. When it comes to when it comes to the young bucks, although they may have been in, they they may have supposedly been inspired by the rockers, but they're clear but they're clearly not the they're clearly not the next rock rockers. Um, no, FTR is n- is not tr- is not trying to be the is not trying to be the next um, Andersons. In that you have what you have or what you have are people who feel like the first incarnation of what the of what they are. Nope. There are certain there are certain certain call, there are certain callbacks that that can be made, but you don't ha- but you don't have anybody do you don't have anybody trying to do the next incarnation of the, of that mm-hmm. kind of setup. The clo- the closest that you could have is is somebody do- is somebody doing a legacy mask thing, and the only one who fa- the only one who falls under that, and even then this is a massive stretch, is Pentagon. Mm, I, I'd even, say, yeah, 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 even, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he he cut the mullet, so you know. No, what what, but... I'm, what I'm saying is that um <laughs> is that the the Pentagon name has been has been one of, mm. has been one of those passed down names for a, for a long time. Yeah, same, same with like Tiger Mask. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's been multiple Tiger Masks over the years, but but trying to replicate anything like. Your Hulk Hogan, your Randy Savage, Stone Cold, The Rock, even John Cena. These are these are guys that are once in a lifetime talent, who either came along at the perfect spot and did the right thing, had the right look that was perfect for the era. Mm-hmm. And you can't replicate that, no matter how much you try to push somebody to the moon, unless they have natural talent creativity and that just perfect timing in life you are never going to replicate it like i i see like like you were saying you know kenny omega mjf i see them as the next once in a lifetime performers i don't see them as the next like the next stone cold or the next rock i see them as that next generation of wrestler that have that perfect it factor that make themselves a long time legendary name in the business mm-hmm. and 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 you and you can't ma- manufacture that it is natural god given talent that creates that and vince needs to realize that he needs to stop scripting his boys he needs to let them be creative let them do their own gimmicks and you'd find that most of these guys might actually be worth watching if they weren't saddled with something absolutely draining. Like, Rome, again, Roman Reigns is my main example. It took how many years for him to lose that goddamn S.H.I.E.L.D. theme song after he went solo? And how many times have they tried pushing him to the moon as a face and have people boo him? Now that he's turned heel, people don't care about him. Because they're trying to manufacture stardom instead of letting it be natural. That's yeah. why you had that backlash a few years ago with Daniel Bryan, because Daniel Bryan came in and he was he is one of those natural God given talents. Mm-hmm. He came in and people were like, We you we want to see this guy, we want you to push him to the moon. And Vince just went, 
uh, he's small. Don't like him. You know, yes, I'd rather, yes. I'd, I'd rather, I'd rather, I'd rather push, you know, Triple H for the eight hundredth time than to put Daniel Bryan over. And what made it yeah. worse is like every time he tried to bury him or turn him heel or ruin him, the fans just getting louder. Yes, yes, like you, you couldn't kill this man. You tried. I'll give you credit, Junior. You really tried. Couldn't kill this man. And that's why I'm like, and that's why, that's why I'm afraid. It's like, for example, like you know, heaven forbid, another great talent. In NXT, I don't think they're probably going to main roster. Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa, they're phenomenal workers. I think they're great what they do, mm-hmm. right? If they ever got to the main roster, I could see Vince putting a gun to their head and just killing their career in Roblox. Well, but it's like um, with Ciampa, he's he's threat he's threatened that if he's if he's ever called up to the main roster, he's retiring. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I know it'll never, yes, yeah, it never happen, but just that fear. Ch- Ciampa run. Chumper, run your contract. Go to AEW. You'll do all right. <laughs> but, 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 but the thing is, in AEW as well, they're not trying to manufacture anybody. No, they're they're trying to they're, they're telling the guys go out there. You have your gimmick. We will work with your gimmick. You go there. You cut your promos your way, and you go out there. You wrestle your way. We'll just give you the the finish that will give you who goes over at the end of the night or whatever, and you guys work it out. And they, they you look at guys like Moxley came in. Moxley was hot when he came in at AEW. People so far behind him after his work in New Japan. And they went, all right, let's strap the rocket to him. Let's push him to the top. Mm-hmm. Now we have people that were clamoring for Kenny Omega to get his shot. He's got his shot. And eventually he'll, put, he'll drop that belt to somebody else. And then they'll have the rocket strapped to them. This place will make stars, but it will make natural Thars. and instead I'd... of trying to shove them down our throat like that goddamn cod liver oil that grandma used to give you every time you were sick right i'd say um, i'd say i'd say a case in point is them is them um them pushing for is aw pushing for the um for their <laughs> tertiary show dark elevation which is br- it's pretty it's pretty much going to be their feeding system for the, for yeah. the future um and I, I will admit that there there are a few um there are a few in, there are a few indie names that I that I'd like that I'd like to see them pi- I'd like to see them pick up down the down the road and you and build and build them up through this. Some of them have have made have made appearances, but there's one that I think um the audience would naturally connect with, and it and is somebody I've been a fan of for the longest time, and that is the man who rules ass. <laughs> I love Warhorse. <laughs> I know oh, I thought, you, I thought you were about the real man who rules ass, Mister Ass himself. But okay, sure. No, no um, but they've already they've already got Billy Gunn in there. They've already got Bill. They've already got they've already got the whole Gun Club thing. Um, but no, Warhorse. I feel I feel like he could connect ridiculously easily. Um, especially especially since with a with a character like that, that's another um another com- another subculture that you can tap into. That being the metal community. In the same way that NXT was kind of tapping into that, what with going all the way up to the all the way up to Triple H, um, letting himself get interviewed by Loudwire, um, and and um, wor- and working alongside ba- working alongside bands like Poppy or um, Baby Metal. Um, oh, I, I would love to see Baby Metal put on performance in an AEW show. That'd be brilliant. Well, they, they, yeah. there was already th- there was already the fact that even though it wasn't on camera, they had Maki Ito make a make a cameo at at All Out. <laughs> yeah, which um, as somebody who's followed her was uh, was very amusing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that br- that brings that brings I with all with all of that said, that brings us to um to ki- to kind of where to kind of where things where things are going to go. And one th- one thing that definitely is going to con- is going to concern me is the holdouts growing more and more toxic. We've already we've already seen this for the last 2 years. What with the fact that anytime anyone says anything positive about a AEW, especially especially if they're big, especially if they're a known if they're a known individual, you have the accusation of being pay, of being paid off like Alvarez gets every week or the or people having a massive hate boner for reasons I do not fully understand towards Dave Meltzer just because just because of how highly he rated um the Okada Omega series. 
Right. It's the reason why is because it's changing the narrative, and the more and the best way to describe it is this is not a political statement. This is not politics. It's that when somebody has an argument that has been rooted into their social norm, and they only accept it because it is, and if something challenges that norm, they lose their fucking shit. Oh, Even though there's logic attached. behind it. Yeah, exactly. They're attached. There's a logic behind it. Like, for example, we have logically explained to people in this amazing podcast um, that there is a formula raw issues with WWE programming and how they have been channel, trying to channel back the glory days rather than something new. Like, they're trying to turn Kevin Owens into Stone Cold. Why don't we let Cohen be Kevin Owens or Kevin Steen? Kill, kill, Steen, kill, you know? Mm -hmm. But that is a problem with them. And rather than blah, 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 they'll just blame it's AEW. They're all stooges. No one cares. Their teacher could be dead in a month. It's like, there is a... Why are you so brilliantly defending something that you know have flaws in it? A perfect example is, like, if you watch any wrestling media, YouTube, or Twitter of these guys doing news, look how vehemently they, they, as I mentioned earlier, as I joke, they mindfuck themselves to believe it's okay. Like, you have PTSD, my guy. Let it go. It's just trash. If you like trash, then that's fine. But don't try to tell me you're not watching trash. Like, it's... Because it's like, how can you convince me that watching... God, who was it? Bobby Lashley versus Drew McIntyre for this umpteenth time is a good program. Hmm. How many times can you see that match before it's enough? The thing is, for the longest time, I liked Bobby Lashley. I, oh, I love Bobby Lashley. I think his best time yeah. was in Impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think the thing of it is, is though... It, uh, crap, I lost my train of thought there now. <laughs> uh, but the thing... I think the thing of it is, is that as, as of right now, more and more people are starting to finally move on. They're starting to let go because it's happening more and more. You know, again, mm -hmm. if someone like me finally jumps ship, how many other people are doing the same damn thing and just aren't saying it out loud? Well, right. it's the the other the other big factor, and this is one that we haven't actually spoken about or factored into any of the equation yet, is the fact that we are living in the internet age. We are leaving. We are in the age of streaming. If you want to check out something different than WWE, the world is your oyster. You can fight. You know, go to Fight TV and look at their wrestling section. They have companies from all over the US. They have some rights to uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling shows. They have shows from the UK. They have shows from Australia. They have all sorts of shows on in one area. If you want to watch New Japan from anywhere in the world, you go to, to go to njpwworld.com, and for nine hundred ninety nine yen a month, you can watch New Japan shows. Yeah, you you yeah. don't. You, we are no longer locked into what we had as kids where you would watch whatever was on television. And usually that wouldn't be anything except the big brands of WWF or WWE and WCW for a while or Impact when they had a TV deal. You no longer need a TV deal to broadcast your show to the world. And people are now starting to realize that just by dropping a couple of bucks a month on a streaming service or something, they now have access to a whole different world of wrestling where people are going to, between different feds. If you want to follow uh, Matt Cardona, you know you could you could have watched him on Impact, you could have watched him on in AEW, you watch him in GCW, you could watch him next time he goes to Japan. Just by dropping a couple of bucks on a streaming service. We are no longer having to go to USA Network or TNT or anything like that of a weekly basis just because that's the only option available to us. We now have a smorgasbord of wrestling from around the world to choose from, and people are starting to realize that they have that smorgasbord in front of them and they no longer need to eat the scrappy meals that they get provided by WWE every week. Really? And it's like a lot of these uh, alternate streaming services, as you mentioned, New Japan Pro Wrestling, um, the Noah streaming service, but the name of it, a lot of them actually give you free content to watch. 
So even yeah. if you're on the fence, you could watch free content. Even if you're a poverty person, you'll probably like. There's tons of wrestling content that pump people upload. You can watch matches there. That's how I caught up with the Okada Omega series. I use YouTube. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you can watch well, wrestling. Yeah. Not, 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 not that we're going to condone you to watch any illegal parties, parties no, 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 no. Re replays no, on anything like that. Oh, no, no, no. They were uploaded on the New Japan channel, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. Uh, if it's on if it's on the legal channels, then that's fine. Like even even for example, I can go to Twitch TV right now, and I'm sure if I go to the wrestling section, there might be a wrestling show on there by a federation. I know uh, Impact still shows a lot of their old stuff on there. Lucha Libre, AAA shows stuff on there. Mm -hmm. All all free. Yeah, you know, it, it's crazy when you can see in. Like you can watch stuff from overseas without a problem. You know, I go to I go to fight. I can find. You know, I've got ICW, WrestlePro, uh, DOA, MAW, GCW, Impact, more just tons. Like you know, sure it may cost me to watch it, but if I'm willing to pay the money, then I'll watch it. Right, and the fact is, like all of this is happening, and. Like, if we, I guess we could spin the timetable forward, you can see, I guess we have more input on this, uh, I guess we're ready to talk about this, or maybe you'll talk about it later, Monk. Um, you notice that Vince has recently changed his profile in wrestling, where now he's admitted he'll have no longer independent contractors now, he's just going to hire only homegrown talent, or make homegrown talent, I believe. Yes, which, um, which again, again is a case of not, a case of not learning from the past, because... What you're gonna end up getting is um a re is a repeat of 1995. Uh, you're referring to the new generation era, or well, the new is it being correct? Because uh, my yes, wrestling. Yes, and I, I know, and whenever I bring up new generation, I know people will bring up Razor Ramon or or um or Bret Hart or Yoko or Yokozuna. Shawn or, uh, Michaels or Shawn Michaels, but um the but the key thing is. Let's not forget about all the really, really fucking stupid gimmicks that were around at that time. I'll, I'll just sum it up in two words, people. Bastion Booger. Mm -hmm. Booger. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll raise you with one. Mantar. Mantar. Either oh, one. Either one. Good old... Yeah. But yeah, it's it's like it is scaring me now that he's now like gone returnal to either make stars his own way. That's it. Like people are currently popping off an NXT Rainbow Edition where we got Tony D'Angelo. Oh my God, what a future star! All he did was walk in the ring, act like Razor Ramon, and slip on, like and did a spot where he's like trying to bribe the ref. I'm like, that's what gets over for you, chumps? Are you so smooth brain? Bribing the ref gets you over? You're telling me a man like MJF who is a heel god who could have promo making fun of your entire existence is not okay. You know what? I wish you people the <laughs> best. Uh, if you guys slowly stop existing in Roblox, my life will be better. Okay. <laughs> Look, um, I think I th the most I uh, I am not in I am not always in the business of ki of kicking people while they're down. Okay, but um, about. But I, I I love taking the boots, Tom. Go for it. But I think I think the most damning statement happened happened this week happened this week where the uh, where the 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 largest demographic for and for NXT 2.0 was old guys, which prompted oh no the the um the high the demogra the highest demographic was people it was the was um was people in their sixties. And, oh no! <laughs> and um, it prompt it ended and pr it prompted the nickname on the Brian and Vinny show NXT Two Point Old. That's good. Oh my god, that's actually scary. <laughs> that's all, all, all serious as a joke as it is. That's super scary because I remember uh, when the Wednesday Night Wars was such a big thing. Which you know, we won that war. High five. Um, it's um. The, I think Brian Vinny or some other reporters pointed out that the only the demographic that's been happening during the hot shotting that's been improving were the the fifty and over crowd, the older cats, and it's like oh my god, older people are watching NXT, and, and it's with Vince in charge now. He's just like pushing all the young people out. This was a young hot program. 
Like, oh my god. That's, I'm having a nightmare now. Oh my god. <laughs> po- we're gonna have Polka Dot Dusty Roads back in some way, I swear to god. Oh my god. But the thing but the thing the thing is when it comes when it comes to how, when it comes to how I when it comes to how I see the future, um, unless unless a co- unless a comedy of unless a comedy of errors ha- errors happens, this isn't going to be a ca- this isn't going to be a case like say t- like say TNA because I do get the feeling AEW is not interested in um hot in hot shotting, even even with the and even I th- I had even thought that the um that the move to the move to TBS that's co- that's coming. Would be would be would be a significant blow, but they're taking a negative into a positive, since they since they introduced a secondary women's championship, called the called the T, called the TBS championship. Um. Which is which is a is a is a nice little touch. So you have you have a and is um cer- it's certainly a first for a lot of women's divisions within within um within the within a lot of within major wrestling companies it's usually just the women's division as a champion and maybe sometimes a tag champion but w- there's never been a secondary title um and i see that i see that as a re- and i see that secondary title no. as there as them as them a, a, a sec- we should clarify though a secondary singles title there yeah. have been secondary titles but they've usually been tag titles yeah which i don't i uh, the idea of the idea of having a tag title as a as a secondary thing with with exception leaves a bad taste in my mouth um but one of the but if there's any if there's any coda that i that I, that I feel is important to give to kind of wrap everything up with a neat little bow you're going to see you're going to because of because of the positive response that you're that you're seeing from pe- from people watching um even even with all they're one they're going to be willing to forgive the the occasional flubs because there's because they have the because the idea of the company having your having your back is art is already ingrained in them but to, but two they're going they're going to not be silent about about how much they've enjoyed the experience and they're likely going to be telling other people it's the it's the whole th- it's the whole thing of you give one customer a good experience he's gonna he's gonna tell his or her friends about his experience and they and that and then that and then his or her friends might co- might come to the place to see if they to see if they get a similar experience. Word, word of word of mouth is the best advertising on the planet. Oh oh yeah, I mean look, yeah. look at how um look at look at how look at how a lot of people are um are trying to advertise with with um with streamer with streamers and the like instead of doing TV mm-hmm. advertisements. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. Um. But but I I do want to just just momentarily like you mentioned the women's division and them getting a secondary title. Look at the the state of the world that we are in today. There is a gigantic push of females in most businesses. Females to be at the forefront. Females to be a bigger part of sporting industries, of entertainment and everything else. When this this whole thing has come across. AEW has actually done a decent job of giving their women a chance to shine. They gave them like the battle royal to work with. They've given them multiple like dream matches by open kicking open the forbidden door for one thing. You know, Thunder Rosa coming in when she was in the NWA. You know that was oh. Brilliant, bringing in the the girls, the Joshis from Japan, you know, putting on these really good matches. Even NWA has put on an all female pay per view and everything else. WWE, yeah, they might have had one female pay per view, but they tried to bury it due to their deal with Saudi Arabia. And then, and then, what else have they done since? Put the belt on Charlotte for eighteen times. Um, they they certainly they certainly had they they had a strong division at one point with the whole. Um, four horse women thing, but th- but um, th- but there hasn't been a whole lot. Se- there hasn't been a whole lot since, and th- and a lot of those four horse women are drifting. Um, once so- once once they once they peaked with the first female main event for WrestleMania, everything from there on out has been. And 
I think it's also too they overextended. Like before, Horse Moon was a great idea, brilliant, probably one of the best ideas for women's wrestling for a long time. But instead of building up old new women, they kept with the old. Uh, the that there's cer- there's certainly th- there's certainly that, and um, there are there are some there are some ar- there are some archetypes and some. And, and some ladies that they had that I, f- I felt that they could have I felt that they could have built around um, as much as much as they were kind of iffy as workers I thought I thought that the iconics were absolutely perfect as the as annoying heels um <laughs> and that that's just that's just one that's just one example that that comes that comes to mind um I mean I w- I would have l- but the thing the the key thing the key thing that I want that I want to try and get at is as I meant as I mentioned before any to anybody anybody coming in I un, I understand I understand the I understand the lapse and and want and wanting to wanting to get that new wanting to get that experience but as as was as Shades had mentioned and as I and as I have mentioned in the past if you're do if you're doing the if you're doing this as a me as a means to say to say fuck junior land you are um you're not you're not going to walk away satisfied because you're because you're going to be putting expectations on everyone else that cannot be ad- cannot be adequately satisfied the be- the best way to, the best way to approach it is you want to see you want to see um good you want to see good wrestling with 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 large crowds and people who are genuinely having fun with what with what's in front of them. Um, anything anything beyond that is gonna be, is gonna be doomed to failure. And to the people who are still diehards, if you if you wish to be if you wish to stick with it because it's what you stuck with for the longest time or or because it's the big name, I hold no, I hold no ill will towards you. Now the other the other guys in the the other guys here in the temple they they might but I won't. No no no. However, I believe right, me. I I am I'm, I'm a man who will be. You watch what you want to watch. Just don't tell me what I have to watch. But he, right. But I'm also more like too. If you like something, mm-hmm. be critical, in understanding it. Stop trying to like convince yourself it's okay because here's something I think important. Mm-hmm. Regardless of what you love, you should be critical of what you love. The moment you give devotion, buying to it, you're no different than a slave. It controls you now, you know. Yeah. Just, you know. Uh, as to to as somebody who to put it another way, I've been an MMO player for 15 years. I played World of Warcraft that entire time. Over the past six months, I have stopped playing World of Warcraft. I have gone to Final Fantasy. Believe me. I have copped backlash from people who still play WoW, going the game's still great. You should come back. It's a it's have a great thing. Have any of them accused you of take of taking money out of Blizzard's pockets or betraying Blizzard? Essentially, yeah. But but then again, I hear that straight afterwards them going <gasps> on this big thing called copium. <laughs> be, 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 because that because that's what a lot of WWE guys that, that they're their long term fans who are sitting there going. This has been a great thing. I've loved it all my life. It'll get better again soon. <gasps> oh, that copium's great. Yeah, exactly. And, and, <laughs> if I... and it's like, and it's like, I really do want this. Like, any, if you're a fan of anything, comics, whatever, etc., have some mm. critical thought of why you like it and what you always want your product to do better. Like, if you like WWE, I'm glad Big E's getting pushed. But think about this: when the last brother who got pushed didn't get a good ending, how can mm. you help that brother get a better ending? What can the product do to make it better? Stop mm-hmm. just accepting the rules he's throwing at you. Again, don't be a slave to your art. You know. Hell, also, I'll, I'll, Fantasy fourteen is great. <laughs> I mean, even with the even with AEW, there are going to be things that need to be fixed. There are tweaks that need to be made. It's not perfect. Oh yeah. And, and to, to, to the, say otherwise, the, 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 the roster size. My God. Yeah, the yeah. Oh God. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> So we're not gonna sit here and say that, that 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 AEW is the perfect savior. It's just right now it is doing. It, there's an effort being made. There's passion. There's love. There's fun. That's why we're switching sides. 
because it's fun. I actually am excited to watch wrestling again thanks to AEW. That doesn't mean it's going. It it, ha, it doesn't have its faults, and I am ready to acknowledge it and call them out if they screw up. But I also know that they're going to at least make an effort to learn from those mistakes and improve from them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, if they could only move Rampage off for 10, 10 p.m. on Friday night to move it to a more acceptable time, like, say, 8 o'clock, go direct against SmackDown, goddammit, then oh, maybe God. we'd have a chance. <laughs> but, but will we know, is it Rampage? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, it, it's, it is boom, 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 Rampage. It's boom, boom, oh, yeah, yeah, God. <laughs> uh, but, it's, but, yeah, it's like the flaws I feel is the women's division is a bit lopsided, I feel like. Uh, a flaw I have is the tag team division now feel after the Young Bucks left it, the tag team division feels directionless. Uh, a part of me feels like certain wrestlers are like, what's like, as much as I love Malachi Black kicking ass, uh, are we moving him up anytime soon? Uh, I, uh, here's well, the thing. Are, I know are, we, guys... are we giving him good challenges? You know, you know, exactly. Um, Buddy Matthews. <laughs> oh, God. Please, please, please. Yes, that match was classic in, in WWE and Extreme Rules. That was classic. Um, here's the thing I also don't. I don't like the Hardy, I don't like the Hardy Family Foundation. They seem like a, just a job of group. Nothing about them screams anything to me. Prior Party's good, but them going heel didn't change. I don't know. See, these are compliments. These are complaints I have at AEW. And one huge complaint I seriously have is, why haven't you signed the best idol, Maka Itoi? Where is our cute idol, motherfuckers? Where is she? Where is she? <laughs> she's, she's back doing Joshi shows in Japan. Sorry, I still pay for New Japan. I love you, Japan Senpai. Um, yeah. Still, oh god, the, I have like the complaints. Of AW, yeah, bloated roster. I think women's division lopsided. The tag division feels aimless right now. Um, there isn't. And Malachi Black. I'm really worried about Malachi Black. I want him to have a good match. I'm squashing his fun and all, but you know. But the th- the thing is, even even with those even with those issues, those issues that we've all just that you've just mentioned. Aren't strong enough to make to make uh, to make us flip the table and say we're and say we're quitting because of the because of that rapport that's been built up. No, I I want to I want to see them take some of the criticisms on board, and I want them to improve because I as as somebody who's who's done marketing, business management, and everything else, you can't have a monopoly on a on a single thing. You know, WWE has had this monopoly on wrestling for so long, at least broadcast wrestling or the brand recognition, that I want there to be a really good competitor. And this is the first time that I have seen an actual competitor come forth out of the ashes that could be a legitimate like play for the new the new big brand in wrestling. Mm-hmm. And I'd I'd say when it and to kind to kind of close off with when it comes to addressing the um the diehards um to to those who, to those who have stuck around since day one you're gonna see a lot more new faces but don't be grognards if they if they end up asking about the about the history of of certain people um tell it to them or or point them in the direction of of some of the matches that they've done otherwise that are being called back to. Um, or e- or e- or even some of the even some of their um even just some highlights on stuff that they've done in the indies or even um, mini docs. Um, there's a documentary there's a documentary on John Moxley called simply called A Sick Guy that talks about his pre WWE days. Um, and how and how it kind of it kind of took him a bit of a while to really get to really get a handle on hit on his wrestling style. Um. T- and when it com- when it comes to when it, once again when it comes to the diehards, if um, if you if the main com- if if the main complaint that if the main um if the main argument that you have is to focus on is to focus on the size or to ca- or to call them a bunch of or to, or use the phrase vanilla midget, which I want that phrase dead in, dead in a ditch. Oh God, I same here, same here. What you're effectively telling me is that you is that you have no is that you have no argument, so you're resorting to ad hom, and if you're resorting to ad hom, you're um, not worth my time. And mm. the only thing that you're going to get is um, laughter, because yeah. because mm-hmm. don't 
because I will mock you, and I will and I take, will do it incessantly. Take the horse blinders off and realize there's a bigger world than what you see in your narrow vision. Because, look, I I am somebody who I'm somebody who go who goes ballistic when, whenever whenever I talk about my particular area of expertise, and pe- and people bring up uh, people bring up the wizard shit, and. So how so how do you think how do you think I'm gonna feel if they try if they try that shit in 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 this particular area? <laughs> just say, just saying, I it's the it's the old thing of being unable to suffer fools gladly. But I think with all, I think with all of that said that that provides an effective capstone for the, for this part of the Exodus trilogy. And Mace and um, Crow, I do want I do want to thank both of you for be, for being willing to come to being willing to come in. Um, more, more than more than happy to come in to the the Glory Temple of Wrestling and speak about it on many occasions. Well, I should note re- I should note that wrestling is is only one, is only one avenue that we tackle here in the monastery. Anything and everything well, is on the table well, here. I, I, I'm so, I'm sorry. The taxi dropped me out out front. And I went straight into the wrestling pavilion. So that's where <laughs> how I got here. I haven't had a look, look at any of the other halls yet. So we'll <laughs> we'll see if there are other other places in the monastery that I might be able to come and spread wisdom and joy. Oh, that's and all the swear cool. words. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was glad to stop on by. I came for the memes, and that was good enough. Um, I only wish death on all my enemies. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is a monastery, <laughs> not an inquisition. Wink, um, wink. Um, monasteries take a lot of forms. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. There we go. Yeah. Honestly, it was a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, definitely. Hope you got. Hope you guys enjoy our good time, and hopefully, we'll see you in the future. Yeah, and of course, um, we. I do have. I do have a. I do have a fair few surprises coming in, throughout throughout the rest of throughout the rest of the week, including 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 a a bunch of interviews that I'm that I'm gonna be do I'm gonna be doing this week and next week, if everything go if everything goes as planned. We'll be ta- we'll be talking about some we'll be we'll be revisiting a rather infamous ga- game in game in, in in that it that is going to be that in a relevant series given recent events. But that but that is going to do it this week for us here for us here in the for us here in Geek Watch. As al- as always, I would like to I would like to thank everyone who took the time out of their of their schedule to come up yep. to come up and enjoy the madness, and there'll be yes, plenty more. It, with... Go ahead. If, if you if you would like to uh, hear or see anything further from myself or Crow, uh, you can go over to the outerhaven.net. We do a lot of video games, pop culture, news, notes, reviews, and everything else. I am a part of the well, both Crow and myself are a part of the Spectator Mode podcast, which is also run out of the outerhaven.net, where we talk video games and a lot of other t- trending topics at the time. So, yeah, if you, uh, again, if you want to go, go to the Outer Haven, follow the Outer Haven on Twitter. You can also find myself at the Mace thing. You can find, bro, what's your one again? Uh, God, well, we have a website. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> what, yeah. What's your Twitter handle, dude, so they can find you? Oh yeah, my Twitter handle is at GetSilius. Uh, I always joke about that, but it says yeah, you can follow me at GetSilius. I mostly tweet memes and other things. Uh, you can also follow me on my Twitch page, uh, twitch.tv GetSilius underscore. I stream twice a week, uh, playing indie games and roguelikes the lore. And you can also follow Mace on his chillaxed Minecraft streams at the Macing thing. Uh, I forgot which number you are. Is you're, you're, two. You're, Two, yeah, some some bastards took one. No, um, no, because yeah. I because I killed the first one by accident. So <laughs> Twitch.tv, the Mace thing too, where I uh, jump on and play Minecraft with the Carmen Rider add-on pack with a uh, fellow me- member here in the Temple Shades, with uh, our good friend TJ Omega as well. So yeah, keep an eye on on us on the socials and the OuterHaven.net, and hopefully we shall return one day and impart more wisdom. And, and so, please, so please keep so as 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 the saying goes. Please look forward to it. But until <laughs> then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk, and join the watch.